children are saying. But there are so many connections, and uh, a connection to the to the song and the string intro. Switch off this and put our stuff. Do we have a, a, a pointer or something? Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe that? what I will be doing, I will still speak from here, but because I have a paper co paper copy. Okay. So okay. I, I, I. And I, you tell me. Yeah. Or I, I can do it, no? One can do it, no? Uh, you need to find it. Work, yeah? oh. Sorry, it's Hello, Mr. Nout. Yes. Nice to meet you. Yes, let me give you my card. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Particularly, we still yes. have an onboarded um, Suzette's replacement. Yes. But currently, uh, we're splitting the portfolio between her boss. I'd like to. I think oh, you're yeah, we've Brian. We've met in the Dominican Republic. Yes. Hello, oh, Vivi. How you are you? Yeah. Go for it. I'll, I'll come afterwards. Yes. Okay. Yes. No worries. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Welcome. Oh, yes. This is the chief technical advisor for the program. You know. I don't think we can use it, now. <laughs> okay. Can, can it be used here? Uh, what, the, the pointer? Uh, well, the, this computer, can it be here? Uh, I don't know, because that's my colleague. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just in five minutes. So, we'll do a quick wellness break, and then we'll carry on with the presentation. Very good. Okay. Thank you, because we want everybody to come back to okay. their yes, senses. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he already told us. But uh, we were asking, can we uh, project on the screen? Is that possible? So he wants to switch to the screen. No, no, no. Uh, you, uh, yeah, it is a, a pointer, yeah. So I think we try to do it and it's uh, projected on the other computer. Yeah, well, it should be. It should be possible, right? Yeah, we're basically running. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Yes, yes, This one, not yeah. this one. No, 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 we don't want that. Um, do you want me to switch quick to see or? Uh, I mean, I trust you, but the most important thing is yeah. that as soon as this wellness thing is over, we have we get our own screen. Because we were supposed to start at 2 and we were going to be late. Um, I'm just going to check the point out. Okay. Real quick. So how do you prefer to do it? You, you, you stand? I, I prefer to stand if I can. Thank you. 
If I stand here, it's fine, right? And then I can. Yes. Yeah, and all this, I mean, they come with the open thing at 2 o'clock when the session is supposed to start, so it's not really for music. Hello. Hello, Ben. Yes. Thank you for being here. Software, so uh, should I announce them for everyone to be seen? Yeah, I think we have other issues <laughs> right now. Yeah. People are still coming in. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to switch to your slides because sure, sure. I don't know when it's gonna start. Yeah, but I don't know. Is this happening now? Because you have a session now supposed to start five minutes ago. So. Okay. Um, yeah, because in the meantime we can try to fix the issue of the of the slides. Sorry about this. Huh? It works? Yeah, I'll switch back to the other one. Okay. Yeah. I need to find a place where to sit now.
Which computer is that, sir? So you can use here, your computer. Okay, okay. No, no, no. So, Jata.
all of you had a good lunch and welcome to the session i am very happy to be here today to welcome you all for this conference for ips from the african caribbean and pacific region so today we will be witnessing the launch of the framework of the acp countries which is going to be which is aim to be business friendly uh, the portal is also going to be supporting value chains through inclusive policies investment promotion and alliances and the project is funded by the eu and the oacps you know is the main sponsor and it's in collaboration with wipa the world association of investment promotion agencies uh, i would also like to take this occasion to invite ismail the executive director of wipa on the stage uh, we on the podium we also have espion the assistant secretary general oacps cecil uh, from she is the head of unit e2 european commission we have bernardo the director division of fair production sustainability and standards and trade from unido stefan from unido he takes care of the division of fair production sustainability standards and trade and brian from the division of fair production sustainability standards and trade unido ismail thank you for joining and uh, i hope we all have a great session today and congratulations once again on the acp portal thank you thank you so much sujata it's always been a pleasure of course to work with unido actually i should thank you very much for being here with us we are very excited to organize a 26th conference by power investment conference and uh, seeing old friends here and the good partners giving us strength further strength and it's always a pleasure to work with with unido Dear colleagues, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the Conference for Investment Promotion Agencies from the African, Caribbean and Pacific region that we organize with the great support of our consultative committee member, UNIDO. As such, I am honored that the two strong partners of UNIDO, the European Commission, and the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States is present in today's meeting, and that they also will share their expertise in tomorrow's panels at the 26th World Investment Conference. WIPA shares a long-standing partnership with UNIDO. Our most recent collaboration was a 2022 survey for ACP IPAs that has been undertaken during this summer. I'm looking forward to some preliminary findings that UNIDO will present, implementation progress from the ongoing ACP business friendly, supporting value chains through inclusive policies, investment promotion and alliances. But first and foremost, I'm excited about the launch of the cloud-based digital invest in ACP platform which is earmarked to support investment mobilization efforts in the ACP regions. I thank UNIDO and the colleagues from their trust and support to WIPA, and I wish you a very fruitful meetings. And I hand over to my colleague and dear friend, Stefan Kratz. Okay. Okay. I would like to invite Madame Cécile Bio, head of Unit EU E2, European Commission, DG INTPA. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ismail, and, and thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here and to hear later more detail from Stefan about uh, the, the new tools that we have here. Very happy to be here together with OACPS, SCPN, and UNIDO uh, 
and uh, to represent this business-friendly program that we have been uh, doing and, and funding and working together uh, because it's a very important uh, area of work to support investment and to support uh, SMEs and creation of value chains. So this is something very close to our heart, something on which we have really, as we can see later, uh, some good uh, outcome to showcase and some concrete tools and which uh, we are really uh, in the EU devoted to continue uh, supporting this area of value chain. Uh, we are um, also very happy to be here today with the Investment Promotion Agency because, of course, the link with the work that you do in the Investment Pr Promotion Agency is very important. Here we bring a bit of a pieces of a technical support uh, to you, or at least the tools that can be used, and, and empower you also as key player to get investment also uh, into, uh, into, into, into our partner country. Um, what uh, is also uh, very important in addition to get, of course, the investment and traction and the investment and, and, and really towards small businesses and towards some of the key value chain is also the investment climate condition. And here, of course, uh, what we hear a lot from our business is, uh, what contact with business that we have, uh, is that uh, this is a very important point also to have the right investment climate, climate condition to be able to, to invest and to put some money on the table. So that's the two, I mean, having the tools and knowing where investment are there to, to support, but uh, having it in the right uh, investment con uh, climate condition and reforms that are necessary also to improve business environment is really part of how we can, uh, how we see uh, support to investment uh, promotion and to increase the FDI in, um, in a third country. Uh, we have worked in this partnership with Business Friendly on, in many, many different uh, sectors in many countries. Uh, instance, uh, we worked in Ethiopia and we supported the strategic investor to maintain operations also in the country more recently. But there are many, many other examples and, and sectors. But today, what we are here for really is this two important now work stream that the program has been working on. Uh, this platform, uh, which is uh, the Invest. ACP platform. Uh, I looked at it again and tested it online this morning and I was really amazed because it is really bringing a very user-friendly uh, key targeted information about projects and, and projects that are looking for investment. So it's making a very good link also to the financial community, at least as a resource there that they can use also for their pipeline um, uh, of funds. And this is very important for us in the EU because uh, we are working increasingly, increasingly with DFIs, Development Financial Institution, uh, to deploy uh, our support, uh, our cooperation support to, to uh, third country, especially in the form of guarantee or blending, and uh, DFI are also key partner in this endeavor, and uh, this is something that will is here to stay and will continue uh, under um, what we call a specific European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus, but we have more and more uh, program and more and more um, call uh, for proposal uh, as this kind of uh, type of um, um, uh, tool, basically, uh, for uh, promoting investment and for engaging with private actors uh, in uh, our partner country. And this is also very important as we are uh, in the EU really committed also to uh, work and to support investment uh, in the area of infrastructures, digital health and so on, what we call in a global gateway uh, strategy that we are putting there on the table to really kind of foster our investment also and our, our, our funds, uh, EU funds, public funds, basically towards supporting uh, this type of investment. So this platform is really very good associating, trying to, to help SMEs and to, to drive also the investment and, and support also uh, DFI. Uh, and the second thing, of course, it talked about, Ismail talked about is, is, uh, um, is the results of a survey. And this is always very good to, at least uh, from, from where I stand, to hear more about what the Investment Promotion Agency are facing on the ground, what, what are uh, the sort of uh, digital and, and data-driven um, um, knowledge that we can get from the survey and understand as better a little bit what is the main uh, constraints, the main opportunity, and the main um, uh, uh, challenges that are coming also for you. So very happy to be here and to hear more about uh, these two projects and contribute to the discussion. And I think I leave, I leave, I will pass the floor now to uh, Esipion, who is right next to me. 
Thank you very much, uh, Cecile. It's really <clears throat> a big pleasure for us for being here today with so many friends. Um, Cecile, Bernardo, uh, Ismael that we met in Turkey when I had hair, still. <laughs> uh, Stefan and Brian that, that uh, really worked for us. Uh, for those that do not know what the OECP is, is, we are the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States. I come from the sea, from the Caribbean, and I represent here His Excellency, Mr. George Ravelo Pinto Chicote, our Secretary General. He's from Angola, and he has left to participate in UNGA this week, so he cannot be with us today. We were created in 1975 through the Georgetown Agreement, and nowadays we proudly group 79 member states working together for a better world. Um, however, I suppose a lot of you don't know us, so I often call us the best kept secret in development. So we, we have been, we have had a, um, a very, a lot of successes, like today, among others, thanks to the European Union that has been our partner since the beginning, and that we, we really work together. This platform that we're going to present here today and the business-friendly program that we will present are part of an overall strategy of 600 million euros that uh, is implemented around with 20 plus programs with many partners. Some of these partners are the World Bank, UNIDO and ITC, which is on the business friendly, but we also work with UNCTAD, with the ILO, with uh, COMESA. In fact, um, yesterday we launched a, um, a COMESA Innovation Forum in Egypt, so it's great that technology allowed us. I participated yesterday from my hotel room. And we work very closely to SADC, to the SEAC, to ECOWAS, to the OMOA, uh, CARIFORUM, CARICOM. So we, we really work together in trying to help our countries. To real, uh, our mantra is to promote sustainable economic development, assist our countries to insert themselves in global value chains to participate in the world economy. Uh, with the objective uh, um, of reducing and hopefully eventually eradicating poverty in our countries. So really, we're really much about SDG number one, and we're really proud to be here today with our friends from, uh, like I said, WIPA, the, the European Union, UNIDO as well, but we cannot forget, of course, uh, the other partners of this program, the World Bank and ITC, because what we're, what we're trying to have is a coherent approach. Uh, like Brian was telling me in lunch, uh, no, but sorry, Stefan was telling me in lunch, uh, the beginnings were hard, like all beginnings are hard, because we had to get together, we had to discuss, it's not always that easy, the coordination role, but what helps us is that we all have the same objective, is really helping our people, working for the small and medium-sized enterprises to have a better life, to insert themselves in global value chains, also working with big companies. In this the investment promotion agencies of our country play a leading role. And we're really happy that our countries really have seized this opportunity, that this platform will allow for exchange of best practices and will allow really to conquer markets hopefully together. Really hope that this platform helps to make a reality the African continental future area, which is really something that we want. It's much easier when you have a global market and we work closely with the African Union and also with CARIFORUM to, try cre to create that big Caribbean market that we all dream of. Of course, it's easier for me, I'm from Dominican Republic, to get from here to my country than from my country to Barbados. But well, that will change hopefully in the future and we will all work towards that. So uh, I would like to, to say, and, and I like proverbs, and one of the proverbs I like is an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go in company. So the company that you have here is not only the people in this table, it also includes definitely Ismael, but every single one of you. I have the honor of having worked in the Caribbean with CAIPA. Uh, CAIPA is a dream, it was a Caribbean association of investment promotion agencies, trying to convince a Caribbean island that your fiercest competitor was not your neighbor beside that together we could build that big market in the Caribbean, hopefully in Africa as well. And, and I would also like to say, maybe say the presence here today with, uh, to the person that replaced me, Karen Expo, Mr. Nolan Laud, uh, that we hope that uh, they continue working together. Uh, to Mrs. Uh, Paz Velasco that works with us a lot in, in Brussels, and which I call sometimes Sunday and Saturday at night, which is, they told me that is harassment, but well, I, I will continue to harass people. But uh, basically, 
Uh, sorry, I, they gave me a nice speech that I haven't followed whatsoever because that's always what I do. The only thing I wanted to say that we are there for you. We need you to change the world. So please help us and really let's walk this trip together and let's hear this platform that we hope brings investment, wealth, and tomorrow that our people will have a happier life. We are working for more prosperous and hopefully peaceful, more peaceful societies through investment, through private sector engagement, and through dialogue. I hope you understood my broken English. As you see, I'm not, a, I'm not a English speaking, so I want to say gracias a todos. Obrigado, merci, merci, shokan, asante, vinaka, fafetai. Thank you. And uh, indeed, today we are here and we are celebrating. Yeah. I don't see Ismail anymore. I, I, I just wanted to, to celebrate uh, this excellent collaboration we have uh, with WIPA. And uh, first of all, to celebrate the fact that we are here all together. It's so nice to see a, a room full of friends, uh, full of people with whom you share the same objectives. And uh, it is uh, 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 oxygen after so long time of being in, in the virtual world only. Uh, we have learned, and we will talk about the digitalization, but this is a fundamental aspect. And here also we are uh, in, 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 so special thanks, uh, Ismail, again, uh, for this wonderful organization of uh, the conference but also for the partnership. And I was saying we are today also here very happy to uh, celebrate some of the achievements of the program. And for UNIDO, uh, this program, uh, the ACPS program, uh, uh, that uh, we have been uh, uh, discussing for a very, very long time, uh, and finally it's so fruition, it's a flagship program uh, for several reasons. First of all, you mentioned it is a partnership with other important organizations such as uh, the ITC and the World Bank, and it has always been, it has been a challenge to start the cooperation. It continues to be a challenge to do many aspects, but it is strategic that we work together, that we deliver together, and it is strategic for UNIDO because we are tackling fundamental issues, and what I like of this program is that at the time we develop these wonderful <coughs> global tools, we are working on specific aspects in countries. We can cover only eight, nine countries, yeah. Uh, but uh, what we hope is that we expand over mm -hmm. the countries. And, and this is, for me, the, the, the most important element. We are using this at pilot countries, but the spillover should be that other countries. And the platform will show. Uh, for me, the, the, the success of the platform will be when other countries start using it, when they will uh, 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 start uh, uh, benefiting from it, and, and, and SCPON, you mentioned it. Why are we here? I, I, I like that you mentioned this very clearly. We are here for the SMEs. We are those, for those who are uh, in risk of being excluded uh, in, in country-wise, but there is a lot going on in investment, but we are here for those who uh, do not have access to the tools, do, do not have access to knowledge, do not have access, but with some support, may be in a position to continue in the market. And this is why I consider this a very important program for us. We have been working with the institutions, and I will not go into details in relation to, to the survey, uh, also very good collaboration. We will have a panel tomorrow on digitalization in general, but digitalization of the IPAs. I think this is uh, worth to have a full discussion, and we will see how to support them within the program, I don't want to mention. As a matter of fact, we have some testimonials after I speak, so I prefer to uh, uh, hurry up with my intervention. Uh, many things have been said. Uh, the platform will be presented. What I, I, I would like to mention still is that we are, have been working very closely with the EU delegations in the country, and th that's another important aspect of the, of the partnership. And, uh, and, and uh, we are uh, uh, really very importantly looking in this post Cotonou agreement to contribute that the delegations have an important role to play in this uh, 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 motion that goes beyond eight and uh, is looking at mobilizing investment. Uh, and and, and we, we, we need to, to change the thinking from 
uh, eight technical co we uh, uh, UNIDO are a technical cooperation agencies, but we are trying precisely to, to, to merge the thinking with the need to combine with investment. And this is why this program is so strategic. It is also so strategic be because we are uh, at a juncture to try to move to uh, 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 social environmental due diligence, and this is changing again the equation. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, 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 we will have the opportunity to tighten the relations with the delegations, and uh, we remain, and UNIDO remains committed to be a reliable partner, to bring uh, everybody together, and this is uh, a, a good uh, example of working together, and uh, this is only a milestone. We can do more, and I agree with you, we can do even more. But let's listen to the testimonials. I'm also more keen to, to hear what our colleagues have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you for the collaboration. Thank you to the EU. Thank you to ACPS, OACPS, for this collaboration. It's great to have this program together. Hola, mi nombre es Viviana Ribeiro y me desempeño como directora ejecutiva del Centro de Exportación e Inversión de la República Dominicana, ProDominicana. Es para nosotros un gran motivo de orgullo participar en esta iniciativa y queremos aprovechar la oportunidad para agradecer a la Unión Europea y a la Organización de los Estados de África, Caribe y Pacífico por el apoyo brindado a través de la Organización de Naciones Unidas para el Desarrollo Industrial Unido con quienes estamos trabajando de la mano en Pro Dominicana en el programa ACP, Clima Favorable de los Negocios. Bonjour, Cadio Fofana Joe. I'm a, uh, I'm director of Investment at Apex, I'm director of Technical Assistance of UNIDO through the tools like Comfar and DIPS, are truly an added value for the work of Apex in the following up of investments in the confidence of enterprises to stimulate the implementation of investment programs and are also a tool for the centralization as well as a important element for the new investments for reinvestments and uh, seeing this as a truly unique opportunity to boost our priority sector. My name is Samuel Do, the general manager, Glarian Limited. And Glarian Limited is a company that is focused on manufacturing of uh, detergents and soap. We've been in the business for more than 15 years. And so we expect that this will impact the country as a whole. And globally by extension. We have about 34 staffs, of whom in the top man management we have 60% whom are women, and other staff, majority of them are youths. We appreciate so much the European Union, UNIDO, and also the OACPS. The European Union and Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States, Can Invest is indebted for the support you've given us. The impact the project has on our case to deliver on authorities' mandate cannot be quantified. It will outlive our tenure in the institution. The ACP uh, program is really changing our working culture in EIC uh, because currently we are working on the investor-oriented manner. Uh, all the system uh, is allowing us to have a validated data which will also allow us to easily communicate with our investors. That is creating a proactive problem solving for EIC, which we didn't have in the previous uh, environment. But with the promotion part, we are also narrowing down the information gap. It's making our potential to be visible for the investors. And that is a really a big changer for, for the EIC. Le programme ACP Business Friendly soutient le mandat général de l'Agence de promotion des petites et moyennes entreprises suite aux interventions de projets. Uh, 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 
and we are now better equipped to, to be able to accompany the promoters in seeking financing of their investments. Companies are asking for this support to be able to benefit uh, from these financial instruments. It's an alternative to circumvent the constraints of guarantees and maturity of loans in traditional bank loans. Thanks to the program interventions of attracting investment flows internationally and nationally. To pay tribute and thanks to the European Union and also the OACPS for supporting the Zambia Development Agency. The digital platform that will be able to assist investors all over the world to be able to engage with the Zambia Development Agency on a continuous basis to be able to structure deals and close investment transactions. This will go in the increased investment in Zambia than we have never seen before. So we are so thankful to the EU, we are so thankful to the OACPS. The message of the new government is focused on trade and investment. And your coming on board to collaborate with Zambia Development Agency is a huge milestone and we say thank you. First of all, thank you very much um, for the welcoming words uh, to Ms. Cecil, Mr. Espision, and Mr. Bernardo. And we would also like to give a word and to welcome uh, Mr. Stefan Kratsch, uh, who is the uh, Industrial Development Officer at the Department of Technology, the Dig Digitalization, and Innovation at UNIDO. So uh, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Also, I'd like to echo the words of thanks for WIPA for hosting us today. And of course, the, uh, the firm support that has been provided on this journey uh, that we have walked together for the last three years uh, and the close support we have been receiving from the EU as well as the OSCPS. So a lot was mentioned about the launch of the platform. Um, I need to crave your indulgence to be a bit more patient till we launch it because we feel it's important to give a, a bit of background about this program which uh, acted as the, uh, the grounds, the platform uh, to actually do the digital instruments that we feel will be um, a significant game changer. So in my presentation, I will be focusing on four main aspects. So first, I want to um, explain a bit the ACP Business Friendly Program, its structure and its objectives. Uh, then, as a second part, to um, give a, an overview of the broader progress of the program. And um, the third part, we'll look at the early findings from the WIPA UNIDO survey that we concluded with ACP uh, IPAs. Uh, many of you have actually participated in a questionnaire which ended up to be quite long, so already, thank you so much for, for doing this. Um, and the final uh, block will be on conclusions and next steps. So um, very, very briefly, you have uh, the, the um, hard copy brochure with you. You actually have two brochures with you. Uh, there's one which is on the overall program, which shows the integrated nature of uh, the three agencies, World Bank Group, UNIDO, and ITC, working hand in hand on the implementation of this important program. Um, the second brochure then zeroes in on the meso level component, which is the one that uh, UNIDO is responsible for. So just uh, a few parameters here. So this program started in February 2019. We all know what happened in 2020. So we had um, a quite long inception phase. Thank you at this occasion also for the patience of uh, the EU and the OICPS in, uh, in giving us the time under most difficult circumstances to collect the information that we needed to have uh, to roll out uh, effective implementation. 
Uh, the, the program will end, um, uh, the meso level of this program will end on 31st December 2025, uh, and um, some other levels will, will end in 2024. The program is titled the ACP Business Friendly, Supporting Value Chains Through Inclusive Policies and Investment Promotion and Alliance. So one of the, the key objectives really is to work at the three tiers of the policy level, the institutional level, and the firm level in providing uh, a significant and holistic uh, support in improving the investment climate. And it's very clear that all these levels need to be vertically integrated to be effective and make a perceived difference uh, for a potential or an existing investors in, in ACP countries. So in that sense, we're very grateful also for our partners uh, in, uh, in doing the policy work, that is the World Bank Group, and also the ITC working uh, very much on the, on the value chain level, working with firms, uh, farmers associations, cooperatives, etc. And UNIDO is working at the meso institutional level, which means under this program mostly with the IPAs, but also IPIs, the institutions, which means SME development agencies, we saw uh, just now a testimonial from APME, uh, which is the SME uh, development agency of Cameroon, as well as some other private sector associations. The coverage of the MESO level are eight countries, and I will um, zoom in in a moment which, of, which are these eight countries. So. Um, uh, I will not dwell too much on the, um, the architecture or the, the, the governance of this, of this program because you, you can all um, do some further reading in the, in the brochures that we have distributed. Uh, we'll, we encourage you to um, uh, start following us on Twitter, Invest in ACP. So we will uh, post a lot of uh, interesting information uh, coming from the countries, but also uh, the results from the, uh, from the WIPA UNIDO IPA survey uh, will be shown uh, as, as, as interesting research pieces uh, on, this, on this Twitter account. So here again, you have the, um, the QR codes to, to go to the joint brochure and the meso level brochure. Um, just very briefly, the theory of change. I'm not going to uh, elaborate too much on this. I already mentioned that by bringing the three levels together, we intend to enhance the investment climate, to generate new investments, and especially channel these investments into value chains, which means we need to know where there are investment gaps in the value chains at the different levels, at the different levels of, of SMEs, uh, playing a role in those value chains, bringing this out and presenting it in a convincing manner to potential new investors. UNIDO's approach in supporting this is following two main streams. The first one is investment promotion agencies should know their client base in the countries. Uh, they should know what are the existing investors in those countries. And what we realize, um, very often IPAs have rather poor databases, rather poor business directories. Uh, the data is collected when the investor registers, but then oftentimes we don't see a logic that on a, on a continuous basis, this data is updated. And that makes it difficult in situations like the COVID-19 crisis when basically every, do every day counts uh, to reach out to those investors and try to convince them not to pack up and uh, reshore or go back to their home countries. So uh, what we're doing under this program is really helping IPAs to monitor not only who is in the country, but also what do these investments contribute. Uh, I think uh, it was mentioned by the, in the opening remarks that increasingly IPAs are looking for impact. And impact can have many facets. It's the job creation, it's the type of jobs that are created by uh, multinationals, is the extent to which multinationals are ready to uh, embed themselves into the industrial tissue of the host country through backward and forward linkages. It's uh, the investment into training, the wages these investors pay, uh, the gender uh, inclusivity, youth, 
all these type of things, uh, unless the IPA has a good understanding about what the investors are doing, it will not be able uh, to work with investors and augment the impacts that certain groups could bring to the host economy. The second pillar of UNIDO is really uh, developing investment opportunities. Um, it was mentioned that there are a lot of financial instruments out there, uh, including very crucial ones uh, that were established under the previous external investment plan by the EU. Now this, the successor program, the uh, European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus, is coming with a lot of, in principle, a lot of capital which wants to invest. The question remains where to invest. And this is where, again, the IPAs uh, have to play a role in providing options, scenarios to these investors. Now, uh, this is the country coverage right now. Um, Bernardo mentioned we would like to broaden, um, absolutely. Uh, right now, um, we are only able to do really a deep intervention uh, along the two pillars I just mentioned in eight economies, six of which are in Africa, one in the Pacific, and one in the Caribbean. So um, this, this concerns Ethiopia, Kenya, Senegal, Ghana, Cameroon, Zambia, the Dominican pa Republic in the Caribbean, and Papua New Guinea in the Pacific region. Another important aspect I'd like to mention is that the scaling up um, can happen through uh, regional organizations. This could be at the level of a continental organization like the African Union or regional economic communities, um, but also specific organizations that have a, a, a supranational investment promotion mandate, like the Caribbean Association of Investment Promotion Agencies, CAIPA, or the RIAFP for uh, francophone IPAs in Western Africa, based in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. Now, just some impressions from the capacity building sessions. Everyone wears masks. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you, can, you can imagine when this happened, and in some countries, of course, uh, uh, it, it, still, it still continues. So, um, I mean, for no one where the circumstance is easy, but of course also uh, we, we had to be creative and develop workaround solutions to keep the program going. Now, um, a bit, the, the, next, the next block is on the, the actual progress of the program. And uh, we, we, we maintain, of course, a system of KPIs, so it would uh, um, stretch this session if, if, if I went into all the details. But just a few selected meso-level results. So obviously, capacity building to IPAs is the backbone of our work, and we are happy that we did, um, between the, the start of the program and today, we did 162 capacity building, and um, also direct bilateral advisory sessions. We want to make sure that uh, we have a high female participation uh, in these sessions um, to, to also make sure the, the, the creativity and the zest of, of women is being put to the, to the fore uh, uh, of, of, of the program. Um, as I mentioned, under the first pillar, we're doing FDI profiling. So right now we're working in the eight countries to update the FDR business directory, and we're happy to, to state that uh, more than 7,000 firms which got registered a long time ago have been updated um, in a sense that uh, the NIPA is able to start working with those investors, investors or segments of those investors. Um, we also have on, on, the, on the platform currently uh, nearly 100 active users. So uh, when we are launching the platform today, this is not entirely correct because the back end of this platform has actually already been deployed uh, for use. And that's why also the testimonials refer to DIPS and the platform uh, that you just saw. Now, um, a, f a few numbers here. So I mentioned IPAs are reaching out to existing investors. So um, you see this, this is being tracked on a, on a monthly basis. So IPAs have been making calls based on lists they have uh, made available to us. And um, we've, we found that 
in some cases, only 30, 40, 50 percent of the calls that were made actually uh, had a real investor behind. And this was a very laborious exercise, but we see no other way how else this could be done. And a lot of investors actually, from what we hear from our IPA, said, this is very refreshing. Uh, I've, I haven't heard much from the IPA since I had registered. So uh, thank you for reaching out again and, and validating that my company still exists. So um, as I mentioned, 7,803 in the system. We then help to screen this further. Uh, Tamer uh, is in the room. He has been instrumental in, on, on this work. And we have right now um, 2,296 um, firms, FDI firms, updated with emails, which means there is a basis to run surveys, to have uh, a, a quick feedback loops from these investors, what they want to do, and so on. The, the next one is, um, that was the first one. The second pillar was on developing new investment opportunities, new investment projects. So right now, under the program, and you will see this in a, in a moment on the portal, uh, we have 716 um, investment opportunity sheets, uh, and they are shown on the portal. And we see some countries have um, gone ahead very significantly, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Dominican Republic, Zambia, Senegal, and many countries are saying, we really want to continue this work um, because we feel what, what us as countries have to offer to investors goes much beyond the, the 40 plus uh, opportunities that, that, that we have on the portal. Uh, and of course, these opportunities can then be looked at from a sector point of view. Um, so most of them are in the food and, and beverage sector, followed by chemicals, textiles, leather. So the large majority of these opportunities are in manufacturing sectors followed by agri, uh, agribusiness, forestry, as well as some services sector. And very importantly, the large majority of these opportunities emanates from an existing domestic firm. So it's domestic enterprises that want to expand their business, that want to diversify, they want to export, and they, they realize that this growth pathway can only, be, uh, uh, can only materialize if a technology partner or a joint venture partner comes in. So um, the, the second graph shows that, in fact, about two to 300 of these opportunities are potential future joint venture projects, where the best is combined towards a good corporate outcome. Obviously, for us, what's extremely crucial is to, um, to start to look at these opportunities not only from the financial perspective, but also to start ascribing uh, SDG indicators towards them. Um, and, and this is shown here in, in this graph. So um, every opportunity has a marker of the three most relevant SDGs uh, that once this opportunity is realized, it, it would help to uh, achieve. And this is a, a, an interesting yardstick then for IPAs to say, well, I want to uh, promote green investment, so I would be looking at opportunities that um, are mostly related to uh, affordable clean energy or clean water sanitation, climate action, and so on. We also started to add um, a women and youth marker to this project because we feel it makes a difference if, if the project owner uh, is a female entrepreneur, or if it's a young entrepreneur, um, because um, some investors are looking for exactly that, uh, and, and under gender lens investing, windows, and so on. So uh, we felt that this is important to show. Now, the last slide here is how, how this ideally all comes together. So, we have, through the Business Friendly Program, invested a lot in, uh, in, in, in codifying the demand for investments, especially demand for SMEs, in roping in the institutions to drive this process. So um, that's an important addition, I believe, that um, we did not send 
any single external um, uh, consultant delegation to do the investment opportunity profiling, but every single profile was collected hand in hand with the IPAs because we feel that it's only if the IPAs takes leadership and uh, custody around these profiles will it be able to then follow up effectively on the queries that it seeks to produce. And finally, of course, now the next stage of the program, and that's why we are very happy when uh, Cecile mentions the new windows of EFSD+, etc., is to link this to the supply of capital, especially responsible FDI, impact investors, investors in the countries, very uh, sometimes overlooked groups, the, uh, for example, foreign chambers of commerce or European business organizations, so because these investors are already in the countries, so it doesn't take a, a lot of a persuasion to get them to expand their business. They know the climate, the business climate, they have learned to cope with it, uh, not just seeing the challenges, but seeing the opportunities. So let's work with these existing investor groups. Um, plus also maybe other groups like uh, diaspora as investors, etc., which I believe is also on, on things that the OACP has, has, been, has been working on. Now, uh, now I'm jumping to the, third, uh, to the third block, which is the early findings from the WIPA UNIDO survey. The survey was, concluded, was undertaken in uh, July and August, and once again, uh, thank you so much for WIPA, for the support, for sharing the lists of the IPAs. Uh, uh, Andreas Hora, who is not here, he was uh, very crucial in, 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 in helping us with this work. So um, we have 63 responses from uh, a sampling frame which comprises around 130 IPAs or IPIs in the, in the ACP region. And this also specifically includes national level IPAs but also sub-national level IPAs. And uh, you see this um, in the middle uh, type of institution. So NIPA uh, is national IPA and SIPA is a sub-national IPA. So we have about um, about 25% in the sample are actually those sub-national IPAs. And I will show in a moment that their capacity building requirements are even exceeding those of national IPAs. Um, we also, of course, uh, try to make sure to have LDCs um, in the group to also bring out their specific challenges, etc. Now, the first question we ask, uh, how do you interpret, what is your main mandate uh, of uh, what you should be doing uh, as an IPA in the ACP region? And the data here um, confirms, so to say, the typical mandate of an IPA, uh, investment climate reform. So many IPAs participate in, uh, in, 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 in consultative groupings, in, in, in uh, public-private um, uh, sector dialogues, they report to their line ministry to advocate for streamlined and improved investment climate reform. Also the IPAs, that's the highest score actually, 9.1 out of 10 is doing inward FDI promotion, which is not surprising. But very, very interestingly, the domestic direct investment promotion is not following far behind. And um, I want to believe that this was perhaps not always the case, at least since I have been working on IPAs. Uh, and it's also, I believe, thanks to institutions and platforms like WIPA that the importance of doing support to the domestic investors um, is, is, is becoming mainstream. And this is shown here through, the, through, through this question. Top targeted countries of IPAs in, uh, in the ACP. Uh, we see uh, um, many of them are targeting uh, China. It's the most uh, frequently among the top five targeted countries by IPAs, uh, followed by, um, by other uh, countries in Asia, uh, but of course also um, uh, European countries and America. So the US, uh, Germany, France, um, uh, 
and, and other economies in, in Europe are still very important. What we found interesting is that since this is an intra-ACP program, we found that surprisingly, a surprisingly small portion of IPAs has, seems to have an active targeting effort to attract investors from other African countries or from other Caribbean or from other Pacific countries. So the intra-ACP targeting is not very pronounced in the sample. And, and that's a pity because uh, many of the investors uh, uh, African investors, for instance, investing in another African country, belong to the AFCFTA, as was mentioned, but they also, uh, the, the business climate or some of the issues may perhaps not be so different to uh, a north-south investment of some sort. So there is a certain, still a certain cultural proximity. So how can the IPA translate this into more um, uh, progressive uh, and more innovative targeting strategies. The next one is IPAs and impact monitoring. So we ask IPAs, what do you want to achieve um, from an investor? What should an investor bring to your economies? And what it shows is jobs, jobs, jobs. So that by far larger score is employment generation, which seems to even um, let's say, in terms of importance, uh, uh, outperform the importance of the, the, the capital formation uh, aspect of uh, FDI promotion. The next one is also related to jobs, skills development approaches. So the, the conduit uh, for skills development is through, through, through the job creation that a multinational would create in those countries, and the training expenditures uh, and uh, the, the, the platforms that are being created uh, for workers to enjoy uh, uh, the knowledge surplus that presumably an investor would bring. Another aspect is local content, which links to what I have shown before. So domestic investment promotion is becoming very important. And the world that ties these two together is through backward linkages. Uh, uh, FDI, which brings in local suppliers, local subcontractors, Ideally, those that also adhere to ESG standards, which is coming on as a strong issue under the EU directive that came out in February, is becoming important. So not just matchmaking as such, but also matchmaking between multinationals and good suppliers that adhere to certain environmental and social standards. Now, these were the social elements. The, the, the green elements come kind of hot on the heels of the social goals. Uh, that you see this here under the green, circular economy, renewable energy, waste reduction. So these are issues that IPAs expect investors also to bring to their economies. Now, a, a big section in this questionnaire also asks about the impact on COVID-19. And we felt um, since everyone, everywhere in the press uh, it is mentioned that digitalization has been given a big boost under uh, COVID-19. We wanted to know what this actually meant or means for the IPAs themselves. So what we find is there's no doubt that ACP IPAs recognize that the COVID-19 impact had an impact on accelerated digitalization. So a, a huge majority of 98% said yes, either to a great extent or somewhat this has uh, uh, fuel digitalization. And secondly, the same IPAs realize that this is not a temporary trend, uh, but this, uh, that this journey will continue and perhaps even at, at an accelerated speed. So uh, you see here that 62% uh, expect that digitalization uh, or the pace of it will expedite even further. Now, we also ask ACP IPA, so in your functions that you uh, govern as IPAs, what are the areas you would like to digitize first? Uh, uh, and that's an important question because budget is not endless and IPAs need to do some, some, some priority setting. So we ask uh, those, those questions, it's a rank question from, from one to 10, and we see that the M&E function, the monitoring and evaluation function, about investors, but about 
the type of impact that invest in, investment has brought into the countries is ranked on top. Uh, this is followed by policy advisory functions, digitalization in aftercare, digital uh, registers, uh, and digital facilitation and targeting. We then wanted to go a bit deeper on the, on the technologies. Um, so what are the technologies that should drive this change uh, if an IPA wants to digitize? So we asked a long list of things ranging from chatbots, digital B2B, digital site visits, digital event management, GPS maps, impact ledgers, even metaverse. Uh, and uh, what we found was the following. Uh, that when it comes to digitalization, the IPAs remain relatively conservative uh, on the pathways. So they're looking on, at more traditional means, online registration, online data collection, or digital event management. But what was even more surprising, even, so these are, let's say, relatively basic function. But what we found even more surprising 50% of the IPAs did not even use any of these basic digital instruments. So it seems um, we are surprised to see that 44% um, of the IPAs have apparently never done an online data collection amongst the investors uh, or organized um, an online uh, or, or maintain an online registry, let alone an online tracking. So we think that this can offer very interesting um, insights for, for, for future support. So how prepared are IPAs then vis-a-vis -vis digitalization? The um, a bit of uh, worrying, concerning news is that not so much yet. Um, we find that five, four in five IPAs are still discussing strategies. They're in preparatory stages, but they're not in implementation which means um, uh, um, it's only in 21% that an active work plan on digitalization is being pursued. Another issue that emerges is that digitalization also comes with um, data management issues, uh, cybersecurity, et cetera, and um, the certificate which tries to, to the security management certification uh, is typically tw ISO 21001, and we ask IPAs, do you have this? And the large majority said either no or we don't even know what this is. Yet cybersecurity and the threats that it brings is uh, an extremely important issue to look at, especially if the IPA maintains potentially uh, confidential investor profiles. So I'm reaching the, the end of my presentation. So we wanted to then know what does this mean then for current and future technical cooperation needs. Um, and what we find is um, the, the IPAs have a, a long list of technical cooperation needs. The, 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 the need becomes uh, even more dire in if the IPA is a subnational IPA. We also find that young IPAs need more assistance than older ones, which is not so surprising. And we also had a strong plea from Pacific IPAs to receive further support, significantly above the average. So the, the, the highly scored support that IPAs want clusters around four themes, investment promotion and targeting, investment project preparation and appraisal, investment opportunity profile and monitoring. If you are interested in more results, um, we encourage you to visit uh, the Invest in ACP platform under data analytics. We show a, a broader, uh, a, a longer presentation. Uh, please also, if you have time, uh, there is a UNIDO WIC talk tomorrow uh, at four o'clock in plenary C. Tamer uh, is, is going to give uh, a talk um, for about 10 minutes. Please also watch out for more research pieces to feature soon on, on our Twitter. And watch out for a former Wiper Unido report 
that we are looking at launching in this, not the second quarter, the first quarter of 23. Last slide, so what are the conclusions, linking it back to the, to the business-friendly program? So the baseline study that we did in the inception report of this program is confirmed by the, by the results uh, that we just collected in this, in this survey. IPAs want investment opportunity profiling support, promotion and targeting support, monitoring support, and project preparation and appraisal support. IPAs are also very much aware of the need to digitize, but they are pragmatic enough to say that, well, we want technology work for us, but uh, uh, we don't work for the technology. So it's a very, let's say, pragmatic approach, which we believe makes a lot of sense. So the Invest in ACP platform then provides an immediate centralized support on certain functions that an IPA may not have to deal with, especially in, related, in, in relation to opportunity development. Needless to say, there is need for further bespoke TC support for IPAs to manage local digital systems like maps, virtual site visits, etc., which cannot be covered fully by, by, by this program. So we want to continue implementation. We want to reach out to you, potentially scale up, uh, further on the investment opportunities, do further investor outreach and negotiations, and also at this stage look at bringing uh, a, a, a more significant intervention on aftercare and linkage support. So we hope to be able to continue this um, exciting journey together, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefan. And we have also with us um, Brian Portelli, who is the Chief Technical Advisor at the Department of Technology, Digitalization, and Innovation at PINIDA. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to uh, explain uh, and uh, provide an overview of the, uh, the main item that was mentioned in the intro in terms of the launch of the Invest in ACP portal. Uh, as uh, my colleague Stefan has mentioned, it's been a, a quite an important journey. It's a journey that has involved and is involving many people uh, in the countries, uh, many colleagues who are also following us, uh, many colleagues working for UNIDO directly and indirectly, uh, huge teams within the beneficiary, uh, investment promotion agencies, IPIs, public and private sector officials. So it has been quite a, an engaging and uh, important, fulfilling partnership building process which we, of course, are uh, aiming to uh, push it to yield to uh, more results in terms of the, uh, what each and every uh, beneficiary and user of these uh, tools is expecting from us. So uh, my intervention uh, for the next 10 minutes is basically to give you a, a very quick overview. I won't, won't repeat much of what has been uh, extensively mentioned already, and um, the point of why are we uh, pushing for these digital tools? It was important for us, of course, to understand what are the needs in terms of the investment promotion agencies from the institutions, in terms of the investment promotion framework at the country level. And uh, we, we understood that there was an important need to uh, increase visibility for many IPAs, uh, visibility in terms of what the countries have to offer in terms of investment opportunities. Uh, a lot of support, ma mainly from a capacity building support and advisory uh, support to uh, strengthen the investment packaging aspect. So what is uh, being uh, proposed to potential investors, how it is packaged, how it is uh, documented, how it is presented, how it is pitched also to the prospective investors. But importantly also to have uh, tools and approaches that not only serve to uh, embellish uh, portals and documents with nice investment opportunities, but to ensure a follow-up after important events 
that uh, leads to, to links between prospective investors, exchanges, and of course, lead generation leading to important outcomes from this engagement. So our main, uh, let's say, vision statement of, this, of these investment promotion tools is basically to reach out to potential investors, helping our main beneficiaries in reaching out to potential investors. As was mentioned, a very important component of the program is on the investment retention because the existing investors are those who are investing mostly, who are those creating or maintaining jobs. So how at best to consolidate this investment, this productive activity, so how to provide value added services to the existing investors. And uh, thirdly, but of course very importantly, especially for those smaller economies to help uh, position ACP countries on the global investment map. Um, just a very quick uh, run through the, what we consider our main beneficiaries, users, as well as institutional partners in this, in this journey that we have started uh, two years ago. Uh, obviously, from the very, very beginning, I mean, we are talking about main beneficiaries of our technical support in the form of the investment promotion agencies, uh, other institutions that are uh, directly and indirectly working in investment promotion. So representative bodies of private sectors, sectors in, in uh, sectors and value chains in the, in the targeted countries. So we're talking about representative bodies representing SMEs and even micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. Here, the interactions with our colleagues from ITC and the World Bank is very important for this uh, beneficiary uh, alliance uh, extension. Of course, other uh, ministries, development agencies in the countries, as well as other developing partners. So, Ideally, uh, we see uh, our main users of our main tools and uh, methodologies, the, the many, many users that uh, were referred to in the, in the previous uh, interventions. The idea of improving the way of doing investment promotion work from the basic, basic day-to-day -day work to uh, yield uh, important, important outcomes. The target users, of course, of the portal, uh, you must have already uh, scanned uh, your QR code, uh, started to see a glimpse of the investors ACP portal. The target users here is, of course, the, those potential investors. There is a very, very long list of who are the investors. There are uh, investors from the corporate, from the private equity, from impact investors, those working in the field of the uh, SDGs, the development financial institutions. Private sector providers, uh, some of you, of course, are also here today to listen to what, uh, let's say, the public sector is equipping itself with in terms of information buildup. So these are the target users which we, are, which we have in, 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 uh, as our objective. So these are the users who would consume and use this information that we have uh, been put together. Uh, Thirdly, but of course very importantly, is the institutional partnership that we want to continue to build up as we've been doing at the country level, but also at the regional level with uh, regional bodies that are representing investment promotion agencies, but also uh, important economic blocks. So this is a, a, an ongoing process of utilizing the various tools that we are, we are developing. Um, I will move on to uh, present, uh, show you um, some of the same parts and features of the portal. So obviously uh, you can do this at your leisure uh, with more and more detail, but essentially I want to highlight some of the more important parts that uh, are uh, in our, from our point of view, very, very important to, to, uh, to mention. So essentially this Invest in ACP portal exists to provide project opportunity information as well as investor related information. So. We are making an emphasis on project opportunities. I will explain a little bit more what we mean by this and how this process, this work uh, is, is, is undertaken. We, of course, provide information on the investment promotion agencies and other entities like industrial parks, industrial zones, providing services to existing but also to prospective new investors. There is also um, a part where we are focusing on the information that we are slowly gathering and uh, building up capacity in the value chains with the value chain operators. Here, of course, the nexus between trade and investment is an important aspect that we are also covering. And uh, some elements regarding the, uh, yes, analysis of the work on, uh, we, are, we, are, we are currently undertaking. So 
From the project side, and uh, please uh, allow me to use steps so that we facilitate the flow of the discussion, but I can assure you that everything works, so you can check yourself when you go back home after the gala dinner today. Um, uh, the idea here is to uh, highlight projects which we refer to as investment uh, opportunities that are captured, identified, formulated at the, uh, at the, country, at the country level. So currently we have um, uh, around 724 projects, real projects, from uh, around 21 countries, because yes, it was mentioned that we are working specifically in eight intervention countries, but through our regional uh, approach, we're also trying to capture as many as possible countries uh, with the Caribbean, but now we're also starting work with the, at the Comesa RIA level. So the idea here is to scale up our, our intervention in, the, in this perspective. So essentially we have these 724 projects, which uh, of course uh, represent uh, an important uh, overview of, of uh, different, uh, different uh, type of uh, projects emanating from organizations, from SMEs. So we're talking about different type of uh, sectors, different type of uh, uh, value chains, also different type of uh, investment typology, so uh, projects which are looking for uh, joint ventures, projects which are greenfield in nature, projects which are seeking minority or uh, majority FDI shareholding. Uh, the alignment with SDG was mentioned very uh, importantly earlier on, so we are trying to match the aspirations and objectives of these projects within the context of SDG because this is also very important uh, a identifier from uh, uh, to present to prospective investors. It was also mentioned the EFSD plus, so we're also uh, aligning ourselves to the thematic windows of the EFSD plus, so we're talking about uh, various important thematic windows that are now being, being given more and more importance by IPAs, and of course total investment cost and uh, investment uh, uh, initiatives, special in initiatives which are supporting um, women in business, supporting uh, youth entrepreneurs. So the idea of this project is basically to showcase on the portal a what we call an investor opportunity summary sheet, which consists with, uh, of main, main uh, elements of importance, of, of uh, primary importance to, as an investment teaser to a prospective investor, which of course has to be um, uh, backed up with uh, an excess of information that uh, I, will, I will speak uh, about in, in, in a minute. What is important on the portal is that for any prospective investor or any user, he or she can actually get in touch with the contact person that is representing the organization that has worked on this profile. So we'll come to, us to this point where initial contact, initial query about a particular uh, project opportunity can be taken from, 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 from this particular avenue. Um, what is important is also to mention that uh, we have a very elaborate uh, part in the portal which looks at the country, so here we're making uh, an effort to represent the entire 79 countries of the uh, ACP, ACP region, so uh, and then within the countries, we are, of course, speaking about which projects pertain to that country, uh, which institutions, which IPAs pertain to that country, which industrial parks, so, and also related publications. So from that perspective, it's very important then to uh, provide, let's say, a landing page where uh, information or basic contact information can be had about a particular, about a particular country, uh, who, is, uh, who is undertaking the uh, the, the, the investment promotion work and uh, so on and so forth. Um, I mentioned also value chains. It's very important that uh, we mention about value chains because this is also very important interlink between the meso and the micro. So here we are uh, building up the capacity of uh, campaigns, investment profiling campaigns in the selected countries where we are unearthing investment needs from, from the various uh, value chains, coffee, fashion and uh, coconut, etc. Um, uh, it's very important to, of course, analytics, etc. So all the information that was presented in the earlier session is also presented here. So this is the part where uh, it will be uh, kept updated over, over time also to uh, explain and uh, keep, uh, keep pace with the, with the implementation progress of the uh, ACP business friendly program. Um, what is important is to keep in mind that 
of course, you well appreciate that positioning 724 projects from uh, 21, uh, 21 countries is uh, a lot of work, and this lot of work is basically being pumped and being facilitated by a back-end solution that we have also developed, which is basically part of the investment profiling uh, methodology that we are implementing in the various countries. And this system is basically, uh, we refer to it as DIPS, Digital Investment Profiling System, which is the essentially the back-end solution that uh, IPAs are currently using, most of some of you I can see in the, in the audience, teams have been trained to provide services to existing investors, but also uh, identifying project opportunities via, via, via the system. So this is a system which also facilitates a certain level of uh, workflow, which is very important because, as you can see from this slide, we are basically talking about a, a process of a verified process. So we're not just receiving and uploading information without any, any, any form of checks. Uh, and of course, there is a, a process of collecting data from the project promoters, uh, formulating uh, what we refer to as investment opportunity profile, which is a 15-page document, which is the backbone of the investment teaser that you see on the portal. And uh, through this process, there is a, uh, a hierarchy of uh, IOP verifying uh, process whereby data is, is, is meticulously checked between Vienna and also the, uh, also the various countries. What happens after this? So once the project is posted on the portal, so the project that you've seen in my first, uh, in my first um, frame, is basically it will lead to a, 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 a next step of marketing those opportunities via the portal. So that's what we are supporting IPAs in marketing, what they have to offer, but also trying to capture uh, initial queries and initial requests for more information Via, uh, via the main portal, but also captured in the, in the digital investment profiling system. So in this sense, uh, these all um, queries from investors are captured in this internal management information system that each of IPA has as its disposal. And of course, this is a, a very important point of understanding which projects are receiving most likes which projects are receiving more queries, who is and requires to uh, respond to queries, how long it's taking to respond to, to queries, et cetera, et cetera. So this is also a very important part of uh, setting and establishing KPIs also within the, within the, uh, within the organizations. Um, uh, very quickly uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, investment opportunity profile. So <laughs> I, uh, I stumbled on this this morning. We were discussing over breakfast. It's important to look at. We have big projects. We have hydro projects. We have baby food projects. We have coffee projects. We have pretty much all the sectors. So it's very important here to uh, highlight the, 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 the extent of details that we are collecting at the basis of these investment opportunities. So. And why? Because we are very much true our word when we say investment packaging is important because it's just more than just having a project idea. It's very important to develop and transform those project ideas into something more meaningful that forms the basis of a, 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 a tangible, a robust discussion with a prospective investor. So this is basically the, uh, what comes out of this process whereby a, a, a profile has a part which speaks about who is behind the project, but also another part which speaks about what are the objectives of the project and what is expected to be, uh, to be achieved with that. Um, I just conclude with uh, my last uh, couple of slides on what are our envisaged next steps and in a way uh, the issue of scaling up, the issue of uh, uh, sustaining uh, was, 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 was already mentioned. It's very important that uh, all this good work that has been, uh, been undertaken over the pa next, uh, past uh, 18 months in the various IPAs is sustained. So these are investment profiling campaigns that will continue, will continue because there will be uh, more attention to uh, more and more partners at the national level that want to be part of this, of this process. 
And of course, what is also important that, that we move more towards more thematic focus of these investment profiling campaigns. So the FSD uh, thematic windows is the one case in point. We want to be able to work more in the realms of women in business, in the realms of uh, youth entrepreneurship, in the realms of green projects. And this is basically the, the main topics of discussions at the regional and also at country levels, also with the European Union delegation and with the European Union. Um, last, but definitely not least, is the proactive investment promotion because we want to make sure that we are not satisfied by launching a portal today and having 700, 800, 900, 1,000 projects over, over time with no action happening. So we want to have a healthy turnover of projects that have a, uh, a lifetime, uh, their shelf lifetime of uh, three months because they are basically captured interest of potential investors. So that's why we need a very important, healthy uh, turnover of these projects. So just to conclude, from a sustain and scale up approach, it's very important to uh, continue working with the IPAs. Some IPAs, uh, some of you actually are in this, in this, in this hall today, are basically told, are telling us that they have never profiled so many projects as they have done uh, uh, in the last 12 months. Why? Because there's a system, there's a process, and they are bringing more and more uh, attention and more and more support from other institutions, public and private sector institutions that before they did not have. So I think uh, for us, this is very encouraging and this is why these tools can then uh, start also providing a very important return on investment. Uh, I mentioned the KPIs. Uh, it's very important that we are also changing the baselines within IPAs also by establishing KPIs of how do we measure what we're doing effectively? How much, how many projects are we are collecting, but how, what is the outcome of this? So how much foreign investment are we generating? How many, uh, how many contacts are we having every single month? So these tools uh, provide a modest, but very forceful and very marked contribution to also setting these KPIs to understand how uh, and in which direction these IPAs are moving in terms of delivering their, their, their specific mandate. Uh, we are also giving direct support to SMEs in the sense that it's not only about identifying the project opportunities emanating from the SME sectors, but also understanding how to bring SMEs or what needs to be done to bring SMEs to become investment ready. Uh, there's been uh, a long lot of work uh, in, the, in, the, in various countries where we're doing specific SME campaigns to also convince uh, some SMEs even to part uh, away from, the, from their business ideas or the project concept. Why? Because they don't trust. Mm -hmm. But Unido is also delivering a very important broker facilitator role here because we are transparent. We're also basically working to uh, sustain the interests and the objectives of both sides, those who have the projects to pitch and those who are looking for projects. Um, it, Investing investment pitch, we mentioned, of course, the issue of packaging is very important, but it's very important to also mention the uh, investment portion collaboration that is happening also at the national level. We are in close discussion with the European Union and the European delegations on what are the main uh, themes of, of projects that are being uh, championed and pushed, in green projects in premiums, but also uh, the aspects of uh, women entrepreneurship and also uh, youth. A digitalization. So these are all very important themes that some of the IPAs are now facing for the first time on their to-do list. So how do we uh, effectively mobilize investment in these areas? Very, very quickly on the thematic, yes, the FSD was mentioned. So this is an aspect where we, we need to work more and more closely also with the EUDs and the, uh, especially the European Union uh, related uh, DFI. So here, there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done also to understand what type of crowding in is required to enable more investors to be able to invest in these sectors. And SDG uh, with a focus on responsible investment, with a focus on looking at new forms of investment that some of the IPAs might have overlooked in terms of uh, the opportunities out there. Last but uh, definitely proactive investment promotion here. So uh, the idea is to have joint and complementary actions we're working also with a number of representative bodies, bringing closer IPAs and, let's say, the diplomatic network in different countries who can actually use these tools, who can use the portal to uh, embellish 
increase the robustness of their investment pitch when foreign embassies are doing investment promotion events. So this is an aspect which we are looking into exploring into a number of uh, selected countries for the next six months. And very importantly, as uh, Stefan mentioned, looking into the opportunities that uh, existing representative bodies of uh, representing EU investors can play in terms of crowding in more investment from the European Union in this country. So, uh, yes, maybe uh, some countries are more prevalent in terms of investing heavily in, in, in ACP countries. This should not always be the case. So there are opportunities and maybe European Union uh, member states uh, could also be facilitated in this process. Uh, it is obviously clear that uh, we cannot do it alone. So uh, we want to collaborate also with private sector providers in terms of helping site selection work through basic uh, use of the basic information uh, that we have on the portal. That is coming always fresh from the oven from the IPAs and from your work. So uh, private sector service providers looking for site selection, looking for uh, lead generating services. So the idea here is to complement, not reinvent the wheel, but complement and strengthen the work that's being done by many, many parties as reflected in this uh, very important uh, conference these days. So thank you very much. And uh, we are available for more questions and clarifications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you everyone for uh, participating. And thank you, UNIDO, for the great collaboration as well. We look forward to the published uh, survey report. And we wish you all the best, of course, for the platform and encourage IPAs to uh, access it. Uh, we will have a break now. Uh, sir? Ah, sure. Uh, in case of any questions before we go for the break. Okay, if no questions, no, I have, uh, I have is a question, there one? Please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, please. Hello, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my question will just go to the last speaker. Sorry, uh, I just want to uh, compliment what you just said about the private sector-driven initiatives coming together with your own agenda. Uh, I think it's, it's really important also to integrate it properly, uh, like the way you have put in your submissions. Let it be introduced to those IPAs, particularly to look at it as a subject to bring it to the table, because most of those countries, particularly from the areas where I'm coming from, sorry, my name is Mustafa Uthman. I'm from Nigeria, and uh, I represent the private sector as some of those companies in those areas. So I feel it's important to have this kind of uh, robust arrangement, particularly UNEDO and the rest of them, to integrate the private sector, to have those kind of ideas that you have, and then for the IPAs to also suggest more things to carry us along. Because most of the issues we are facing is you will have a visibility, you will have everything that you want to do, but then the IPAs don't even know you. So there's no data actually, basically, in some of those areas. So that's why I said it's very important to actually integrate this uh, arrangement that you just brought. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bibi Olufori. I'm from ITPO, UNIDO, Nigeria. And um, first and foremost, I might you know, make an attempt to address Mustafa's um, observation and then also ask a question. So on Mustafa's observation, we're actually working together with um, IPAs to ensure that they're all carried along. We're looking at the type of data when it comes to um, actual granularities when it comes to socioeconomic um, situations around the investment opportunities, apart from just the invest investment opportunities in themselves, to ensure that um, they are all carried along, to ensure that this is a portal that is as good as um, physical um, contact when it comes to profiling and assessing, you know, the viabilities of investment opportunities and that brings me, I hope this clarifies and we can always step aside yeah, to okay. talk about this one. So, <laughs> so <laughs> UNIDO is in Nigeria, UNIDO is in most, of, um, in most African countries and this is what we're trying to do to ensure there's an integrated effort to pull this all together on the portal. Now my question is for the portal, 
when it comes to qualifying the data that is uploaded to it, and when I see on the MESA level you're looking at, you know, um, policies around investments, and this is going to be peculiar per state, what kind of um, considerations do you have for states or countries to actually give an approval or a stamp of approval to the data that is uploaded, especially when it has to do, you know, most of them with those um, uh, indigenous or peculiar policies for, for the countries? Thank you for the question. Um, regarding the, the, the approval, perhaps um, I, I would refer back to, the, to the how, how the workflow is conceived. So um, we actually want the IPAs to collect uh, or define the investment opportunities it wants to collect based on certain criteria. This could be value chain priorities as those that we may find uh, mentioned in an industrial policy, for example or also regional strategies to develop regional value chains. So that should inform um, the, 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 uh, the start of the, the investment opportunity profiling. It should not just be any investment opportunity. So we also need to be careful in not having an abundance of investment opportunities uh, on the portal. So we feel it's not the, the, the number that matters, but also the robustness of what's being shown. And then, of course, if we have uh, the government then um, providing support uh, to, to these investors who, 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 take, uh, uh, who, who take a step towards investing into an SME or an indigenous firm, which is a risky undertaking because uh, joint ventures can be quite risky uh, because both partners have to find a common objective. Uh, there are different cultural discrepancies, there are technology discrepancies, there are language discrepancies sometimes, etc. So if that is a process that host country government support, perhaps through incentives uh, um, uh, or even some tax holidays, etc., um, that uh, to us would seem like a, a, an innovative, a progressive way of doing uh, uh, um, you know, investment facilitation for certain investor groups that have the likelihood of making a larger impact on the ground than others. So definitely this is an effort that uh, uh, we want IPAs to spearhead. And I want to refer back to the original design of the program. That's why we have three tiers. We're not working too much at the policy level, but the World Bank does under the business friendly program. So if we encounter a situation like that, we would activate that tier led by the World Bank to provide support in a programmatic, holistic fashion. Thank you. Hi, I have one quick question. My name is Leo Naut uh, with Caribbean Export Development Agency. And um, mostly on the investment promotion portal with the projects, um, my understanding is that you could have the most perfect website in the world, but it it, it will be dependent on the audience that is exposed to this website. Um, what efforts are being put in place to ensure that investors look at this as a resource? Um, because we need to have the captive audience for it to motivate the IPAs to want to keep putting, you know, use it as, uh, as a way to profile projects. So just wanted to know in terms of the private sector engagements that you're doing to promote the website, like if that is conceived in the plan or are you partnering with anybody to bring this to, to, um, to the general audience of, of, in, of FDI? Yes, thank you. It's uh, probably a six million dollar question of uh, everyone, everybody's mind. I think uh, what is important uh, to mention, and you're perfectly right, I mean, all, all this work will not be as successful if we don't uh, focus on the, 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 the target user, so the audience who is expected to benefit out of this. So, uh, but uh, we also see it that uh, in order to have a captive audience, you need also uh, important content. 
And uh, that's basically where we start off with, to understand what is, what is required and what could be that extra element. It could be some additional information, some additional analysis, some additional metric to be attached to an investment opportunity that could, uh, could be, uh, m let's say, more beneficial to the, to the page. Needless to say, yes, uh, a lot of work is being uh, done uh, behind the scenes to rope in public, private sector also to create the, the right audience. However, what we always say is that, uh, and some of the IPAs are also here, uh, know uh, very well what, uh, what this message is, we cannot do it alone. So this has to be a co-process of let us help you do the investment targeting. Let us help you also complement as much as possible your investment promotion work. So, uh, and this is something that is very important even at the level of IPA alone cannot it has to work within an ecosystem with a national level that, of course, needs to uh, support this less than fragmented approach of uh, mobilizing investment. So working on both fronts simultaneously and, of course, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, partnership building at the level of countries and also regions. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Lisa Arstavik. I'm with UNDP in New York. Just a quick question. I was wondering, um, how do you go about managing the negative impacts so that positive impacts are maximized and negative impacts are reduced or, or minimized? Um, any investment will have positive and negative impacts. So I'm just wondering how you, how you work uh, on that, how you analyze that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, this, is, this is a very good question. Um, positive impacts usually come also with negative impacts and that we find in the SDGs themselves sometimes, that there's sometimes an inherent conflict perhaps in, in, in meeting one, one SDG could go to the detriment of another one. Um, what we want to describe is rather the, the process to start measuring the impact and, and we even find ourselves at the early beginnings of this process. So what we want an IPA to do is to have a regular CRM system to understand what, what at different points in time, what impact investors are making to the economy. And that sometimes may, uh, it may not suffice to just let the investor speak about its own impact, but there are also other, other means of um, assessing uh, whether impact is being made. For example, uh, standards, uh, sustainable standards can help in measuring uh, an impact. Uh, and, and, and that is uh, a very important uh, uh, tool in, uh, in, in international trade because consumers want to see by the product they buy or by a service they, 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 they achieve, uh, they want to know that it was not deleterious to the environment or it is not based on you know, workers' exploitations, etc. So I would say is, is uh, an interesting nexus, which I find is not explored enough, where IPAs perhaps should also be working with SME certifying organs more closely in seeing what is happening and to what extent SMEs are able to meet certain, certain international standards, including sustainability standards. Thank you. Last one. Take the last question, if that's fine. Uh, we are still around, so uh, please. Yes, there is. Yes. Please be brief. Yes, thank you. Please. Um, I'm, I'm uh, Joseph Gibson from uh, Malawi. Uh, I have a technical question of sorts about the portal. Um, I noticed that it, it has a, a, a list of um, a different number of things, except there's no links to to uh, uh, to the promoters themselves. Is that by design, or is that something that's still being worked on? Uh, the investment uh, promotion um, uh, agencies are not don't have a a link on this portal. Is that by design, or is that something that's still being worked on? They have documents on there. 
but no actual link to to their websites or, or their actual portals. So I, I was just wondering if that's an advertising issue or uh, if, if, if it was a, a decision that was made uh, out of strategic uh, purposes. Actually, due to, due to time constraints, we were not, thank you for the question, uh, due to time constraints, we were not able to show two additional features on the portal. They, they are uh, related to showing investment promotion institutions and agencies in the ACP region, their contact details, uh, uh, their websites, their Twitter accounts, etc., uh, as well as special economic zones and industrial parks. So um, if, if you go to the country landing page, what the landing page will offer are four things. Project profiles, the IPA contact, the, uh, the SEZ or industrial park uh, contact, if there is one in the country, and then f fourthly, the, uh, uh, the, the link to the main investment promotion publication. So um, we, we, can, we can walk you through, through, through the platform. So th we want to empower the IPAs. Uh, we want to also empower, let's say, uh, business diplomacy, perhaps minister through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, which is an extension to the IPA in many, in many of, of, of the host countries where embassies are located. We want also to bring in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to have a reference point if they engage with potential investor in their country to bring them closer to the, to the originating IPA uh, as well as special economic zones, authorities or uh, site administrators. Thank you. And uh, who should we contact if you want to update or to add some information about our country in this platform? Uh, yes, please contact us. Yes, uh, if, if you mean uh, uh, if you want to... The, the exact contact? Uh, the, the contact is shown yes. on the, on the main, main page. Okay. Investment portal at unino.org. So you can send us an email uh -huh. uh, or you can contact, contact us directly and, and, and we will attend to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. We thank for the patience, for the big interest. Uh, we see that uh, we have to continue with this discussion. There is another session going on. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Uh, before everyone leaves the room, uh, may we kindly ask you for a group photo, which we will do here in front of the stage. And if uh, anyone wants to leave the business cards, uh, we can also collect this at the entrance door. Thank you very much.
Ismail le fait. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the delay. Uh, it's due to the previous session being ended a bit later. And thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ismail Arshahin. If you don't know me, I'm the executive director of VIPA, World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies. Welcome to our session. And um, it's a great pleasure, actually, to see you all here. And this session is being provided in two languages, in French and in English. Um, let me, well, I have, a, I have a written statement here, speech, but I would like to speak a little bit about the background of this project, right? Because this is a project that we are very much excited about, we've been very much excited about. And actually, all had started in 2016 when we first had our meeting of LDCs in Antalya. And LDC colleagues approached to us telling that, okay, we should also have IPAs here, right? And we were the one to bring the LDCs. LDC IPAs into the discussion of LDC conferences. And later on, we have been developing a new project for that. Later on, including new members, new institutions, new organizations into that project. And we have been developing a new project, a pilot project <laughs> out of it. And pilot project already finalized. The first phase of the pilot project already finalized. We are running the second phase of the pilot of that project. And you know what? Recently, we have also gone for a project which is specifically designed for LDC countries and Francophone LDC countries. This is what I should say. And only in French language. Therefore, uh, I really have the honor and pleasure of being here with you as a Francophone. Uh, it was actually my promise to my members, to all members, to all member IPAs that we are going to run a French, fully French project. And thanks to the support from EIF, first of all, and afterwards, thanks to the support from ISDB, with whom I am always honored to work together, it was possible to create this project. On the other hand, today we of course have Mr. Ratnakar Atikari, who is the executive director of EIF, who has been supporting the idea since the beginning and for whom I'm really excited and thankful to. And we also have Mr. Usama Kaisi, who is the CEO of ISIC and with whom we have been working since a long time. This is why I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bit more excited than the other sessions for the session, right? We are among partners. An additional thing is we have OCO Global with us as well, who is conducting this project for Francophone LDC IPAs. And um, of course, we have the pleasure to work with them as well because they have been working with the companies. I am highlighting company importance of the companies for IPAs, why, importance, uh, why IPAs uh, should be in direct touch with the companies, why we should listen from their feedbacks, etc. And this is exactly why we have decided to go to work with the OCO Global, because they have direct interaction with firms. With not just institutions, but they also have that background of companies. They work closely with them. Therefore, I am uh, also the pleasure to have Monsieur Laurent Sanssouci, Vincent Rofast, uh, with, uh, with us today, and I would like to thank to them as well. And uh, again, I will not read my statement. I think it was by heart, because it's better if it's by heart, and I really have the pleasure to welcome all the participants, all uh, the speakers, and I think I should hand over to Mr. Ratnakar Atikari, Your Excellency, to make the opening statement. Thank you again. Thank you. Do you want me to come there? You can speak there or come here. You're the boss, sir. Okay. You can speak there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Smile, for setting the tone and. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is, this is such a pleasure for me to, to speak uh, in front of you and be a part of this uh, event. It's something that we envisaged uh, in the beginning of our engagement with uh, WIPA. But then it took a while for us to actually start putting this into a practical shape. Um, Prior to this project, what we 
uh, tried to do initially was the uh, was to develop a capacity building program for LDCs in general, which included uh, several Anglophone LDCs uh, for a different reason, because the initial idea was to provide support to graduating LDCs. In the context of their graduation, they would face financial crunch and they would not be entitled to the kind of official development assistance or aid for trade support that they have been receiving in the past. So we thought it would be important to build their capacity. Then we joined hand with WIPA to build their capacity. It so happened during the time of COVID, we managed to bring together, initial idea was to bring together eight countries to build their capacity and we managed to bring together 20 countries where we build capacity. Then we thought we should go for the second phase of the program and that is specifically targeted to Francophone LDCs and this is where we are. And I'm very proud to have undertaken this journey together with WIPA and then also have the um, you know, ISDV group join us in this uh, noble endeavor. Um, let me uh, say a couple of uh, points on the heightened significance of FDI in the context of post-COVID situation. The, because of COVID-19, most of the LDCs, including Francophone LDCs, have been facing significant fiscal squeeze uh, because of the reasons that are obvious, including the fact that they had to spend a lot of resources on social safety net and as well as on the vaccine and other kinds of things, as a result of which there has been a significant fiscal squeeze. So therefore, it is important for them to mobilize private investment. And the, the heightened significance is even amplified by the fact that there are two other elements that come to come into play uh, at the current juncture. One being the conflict that we are in, uh, seeing in Europe between Ukraine and Russia, as a result of which there have been significant rise in fuel prices, uh, food prices, raw material prices, uh, and what have you, as a result of which uh, there's a, a significant fiscal squeeze. Along with that is the need for countries to implement their national, uh, nationally determined contribution as a part of uh, the, um, the, the, the climate change agenda, as a result of which they need to spend more resources on adaptation financing because adaptation financing is very limited anyway globally. So therefore, there is a need to mobilize additional foreign direct investment. Also, in the context of the fact that the LDCs, uh, particularly Francophone LDCs, have now seven, seven years and few months remaining to achieve sustainable development goal for which the resource requirement is used. So that being the basis, we, if we look at the data, it's, data is not very encouraging. You know, if you look at the UNCTAD World Investment Report, the recent one, compared to 2000, um, there was a comparison, if you look at the report, between the Istanbul program of action period, which is the LDC, UN LDC 4 period, which is 2011 and 2020, and 2021. If you look at those figures, there's a, these numbers say that you know, LDCs overall, their FDI increased by 3%, but that's in comparison to other countries, that's nothing. And, and there is a concentration of uh, uh, resources, actually, when we talk about the FDI resources, they are essentially concentrated in five LDCs, basically. Cambodia, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Myanmar are the major recipient. What happens to other LDCs is a kind of question. And also the fact that data tells us that the, the sectors in which which are actually the sectors which are important from the perspective of industrial development, productive capacity building, um, or SDG, sustainable development goal sector. If you look at those sectors, they have actually declined. Um, and particularly worrisome is the fact that greenfield 
projects investment in LDCs have declined by 50% overall, whereas in the post pre-COVID situation, they had actually increased by 3%. So if you, if you look at all of these data, you know, you see that there is a um, greater need for, for building capacity of uh, uh, list developed countries in general and francophone list developed countries in particular to attract investment, to put in place the investment regime that is um, attractive for foreign investors to put in place an active promotion strategy, including now uh, emerging digital promotion strategy in order to promote foreign direct investment. And to retain foreign investment, the aftercare services that are necessary to put in place in order to retain investment. We need to build capacity of LDCs on these three areas in particular. So here, um, this is precisely what we are trying to do. And I would like to end by highlighting one important point, is, which is the following. See, we as EIF is a partnership organization. We are a partnership, or partnership of 51 countries which are our beneficiaries, including Francophone LDCs, and some of them also graduated countries. Uh, 24 donors who contribute to our trust fund, as well as the eight international organizations, including World Trade Organization, where we are currently housed, and um, World Bank, IMF, UNIDO, and others, UNCTAD, who are also our partners in various other investment-related initiatives. We value partnership as the chief vehicle through which we can build capacity of LDCs. It cannot be done by WIPA alone. It cannot be done by EIF alone. It cannot be done by ISDB alone. Therefore, we've come together to deliver this capacity building program. And this, I would say, is just a beginning of a process whereby we would be in a position to build the capacity of uh, Francophone LDCs so as to be able to uh, attract investment in sectors that matter the most, in sectors that would help them to enhance their productive capacity, in sectors that would help them to address their supply side constraints, in sectors that would help them to participate in the uh, strategic value chain that is important in the current context. So with these words, I would like to thank you once again for your kind attention and thank you, my, our partners, for this partnership. Uh, we have a long way to go, but this is a, a good beginning, I guess. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Atikari. Actually, we should thank you on behalf of all of our members, especially this time from Francophone members. And we are very much looking forward to be working together. And I would like to leave the floor to Mr. Usama Kaisi from ISIC, who is the other partner of our project this time, and we are very much honored to have you here. The floor Thank is yours. Thank you very sir. much. Mr. Irshahin, WIPA Executive Director, Mr. Adikari, Executive Director, EIF, Mr. Sonsusi, Director, OCO Global, and Mr. Rafust, Director, OCO Global as well. Assalamu alaikum and a very well and very good afternoon to all of you. I would like to start by thanking WIPA for partnering with the Islamic Development Bank and the Enhanced Integrated Framework, EIF, in organizing this important roundtable in the context of our joint program for enhancing investment promotion capabilities in Francophone countries. And this is in collaboration with our partners with OCO Global. I would also like to thank WIPA for providing me with this opportunity to address this August gathering. The program Enhancing Investment Promotion Capabilities in Francophone Countries was launched virtually on 1 June, 1st of June 2022, followed by a webinar on 7 July 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, investment promotion agencies, IPAS, institutions, that are mandated to attract foreign direct investment. They are currently in a very challenging position. They are at the forefront 
of investment promotion, business attraction, and supply chain management. Investment-related challenges will likely affect IPA's core functions, activities, and operations in the near and medium term, and impact their contribution to economic recovery efforts. The pandemic, you would agree with me, has posed severe challenges to FDI flows, resulting from protective measures, lockdowns, and disruptions in global supply chains. However, despite the initial signs of recovery from the crises, the situation is still alarming for least developed member countries, which are already battered by the impact of the pandemic and climate change, according to the new finding of the Global Crisis Response Group, published on 13 April 2022. We all agree that FDI has always been one of the main engines of economic growth through stimulating, stimulating institutional upgrading, supporting the transfer of knowledge and managerial capacities while helping better integration within the global economy. In this regard, understanding investors' motivations and the investment host countries' comparative advantages are essential to attracting FDI. Ladies and gentlemen, this program represents an excellent opportunity for improving the capacity of investment promotion agencies. Also, national implementation units and other governmental officials, government, government officials in IDB Francophone member countries to attract and facilitate sustainable investments. The program as well focuses mainly on what IPAS can improve to attract and facilitate sustainable foreign investments, improve the business climate, and leverage additional resources to meet the sustainable development goals targets. The program also encourages dialogue and cooperative cooperation with relevant ministries, local stakeholders, and relevant international organizations for investment promotions in the Francophone countries. The impact on global investment trends and inflow into LDCs will also be considered, and related challenges and opportunities will be identified and addressed. It will also involve training workshops and roundtable discussions like the one we are holding here today, case studies and testimonials from foreign investors and how they see the role of IPAS in addressing their need better. Uh, IDB, since its inception in 1975, has recognized the crucial role of FDIs in spurring economic growth and development. In 2019, they launched the program of the Regional Cooperation and Integration, and this is the program that has been involved here with WIPA and with EIF. And they are promoting as well South-South and global cooperation, reinforcing complementarity and establishing closer dialogue between member countries. To capitalize as well on this potential, IDB has another program, which is ITAP, which is the Investment Promotion Technical Assistance, that is devised to build necessary technical capabilities, ensuring regulatory condition while promoting investments among the member states of IDB. I would like just to go over the subject of the round table right now. And this is how the recent post-COVID-19 pandemic are affecting the investment trends. I can say that the investment trends are encouraging, although tempered by the caveats of the, the demography, economic status, resource affordability, and capacity. It was mentioned by Mr. Adikari about the statistics from the OECD, and definitely they are, while they are somehow encouraging, but we see that they are skewing toward the developed world and not to the LDCs where it is most needed. So we can see here just quickly, OECD estimates for Q1 2022, global FDI float continued on the upward trajectory, which is 28% in, uh, compared higher, 28% higher than Q4 2021 at 535 billion. 
Similarly, global FDI flows reached their highest quarterly level in the past five years, and on, on, and on a year-to-year -year basis, global FDI flow increased by 15% compared to Q1 2021. But to go to the context of this roundtable, which is Africa, so it says that the FDI flows in Africa reached a record, 83 billion from 39 billion in 2020. It only accounts for 5.2% of the global FDIs. The reality is that while FDI flows have increased in Africa by 113%, but the base is extremely low. If we go by sub-regions, sub-Saharan Af Southern Africa attracted $42 billion in FDI in 2021, up 895% on, up on 2020. West Africa, $14 billion, up 48%, and $9 billion for North Africa and Central Africa each. And those show a decline of about 5 and 1% respectively. Uh, investment outlook uh, is beholden by the uncertainty that has been mentioned by Mr. Adikari, which is the geopolitical issues, and we are just exiting the COVID that have shown us as well that there are still variants that are associated with health crises. Uh, also, we cannot discount here the labor and supply chain bottleneck that was mentioned as well. One issue that we have as a, as a risk manager, myself working in an institution that ensures risk, uh, risk through uh, PRI and, and, and trade credit insurance, we always account for the uncertainty of investors and the risk adversity. And this is something that we have to look at as well, regardless of how much regulation we put, regardless on whatever we do as institutions, developmental institution, we always have to answer these objections or rejections that are coming from the investors. They are risk averse, and this is how you know, capital works. So investors uncertainty and risk adversity, you know, they are putting significant downward pressure on global FDI, and specifically this year. And this effect on investment flow to developing countries in 2022 and beyond are difficult to anticipate and largely depend on their exposure and response to the triple crises that we are facing today, be it food, fuel, and finance. So what are the impacts for, IP, for IPS in the long-term strategy? It was touched upon again by Mr. Adhikari, but let me here quote you know, the Secretary General of UNCTAD, Rebecca Greenspan. She says, recovery of investment flows to developing countries is encouraging, but the stagnation of new investments in least developed countries in industries important for productive capacity, important for productive capacity, and key SDG sectors such as electricity, food, health is a major cause of concern. So what is she trying to tell us here? That the focus should be there and not for us to have investment flowing into countries without having a focused approach to where it is going. So there is a need for productive capacity and investment through the, the Sustainable Development Goal. And we have seen today as well, the session before this, talking about data and digital use of information in order for us to direct investments. Also, we have to look at climate change and adaptation. Very quickly here, one thing that we have to always look at is the financial system. There are tax reforms that are going to happen shortly at the level of the globe. And these tax reform may present an opportunity for developing countries, not only from a revenue perspective, but also from the investment attraction perspective. So this is where countries, they should work on their regulations in order to be able to attract investments. Strategically, tax competition will decrease because of these new regulations and investment promotion toolkits, they need to review their, what are they are intended for, what they are intended for to make costly incentives more sustainable. Um, our sister concern 
I would say, at the World Bank is MIGA. And um, they are working right now with the uh, G20 on the report on the use of credit enhancement and de-risking tools. And in that report, I st strongly concur with whatever came in that report. And it says that a partnership approach, again, it was mentioned here, that a partnership approach to growing private investment is through expanding political risk insurance and credit enhancements, which historically has provided effective de-risking and thus catalyzing private investment into emerging markets through capital efficiency instruments in combination with debt and equity financing. This has the potential, and I know this is my industry, to materially increase the flow of private sector capital to developing economies. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Kaisi, thank you so much for your, for your speech. Um, what I would like to say, these projects are created on a demand-oriented basis. This is what WIPA do. And we try to understand what are the expectations of the LDC IPAs from us, from WIPA. Therefore, we do believe that we can tailor our capacity building sessions. And I am happy that we can do it this, this time, face to face, because I received very positive feedbacks from yesterday's session from Laurent, and there was a very positive interaction was going on. This is what we look for. And during online sessions, you rarely do that. And I do hope that with your strong support, and I'm happy that you also mentioned that this is just the beginning, we are very much looking forward to increase the number of these capacity building sessions with LDC IPAs. This time, uh, 20 LDC IPAs registered for the conference. I think together with the other missions, it's going to reach the 30 uh, LDCs participating to the conference this year, maybe first time at that number. Therefore, I can't thank enough for your continued support, Mr. Atikari and Mr. Kaisi. Therefore, we are very much looking forward to enhance our collaboration. And the next session is going to be together with ANCTAD, ILO, and, uh, and UNIDO, and this is the multi-agency project, which is going to be also in the safe hands of these big international institutions with whom we are always having the, having the great pleasure to be working together. So we have the hands-on LDC IPAs all together. I am very much proud that we all together made this happen, and we hope that we can deliver the results and the impacts as well for the future. Thank you so much. and I'm. Handing over to Laurent without making it too, too long. Over to you. Thank you very much. As this program has been designed for francophone LDCs, I will now switch to French for those who uh, don't understand French. Obviously, I will try to speak slowly, but uh, probably you will still need some uh, translation. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much uh, once again for this introduction from WIPA, AIF and the Islamic Development Bank. We will be dealing with this a presentation on recent trends in international investments, even if a certain number of these trends have already been presented as an introduction. And then on the impact that these recent trends for international investments have had for promotional agencies. First, a rapid recap. If we look over the past 40 years, years of high growth at the global level for international investments, this growth began at the beginning of the 80s, the growth of flow and flows which have increased because numerous factors encourage this growth of international investment, technical, technological investments in telecoms, in transports, in po policies with extensive liberalizations and free zones and growth of international investment. This doesn't mean that this growth has always uh, run uh, Linearly, there were impacts, very sudden drops, and we had one example 
I'm speaking of history, with what's happened over the past two years. But we mustn't forget that there had already been a certain number of crises in 92, 93, right after the first Gulf War in 2002, 2003, with a succession of crises, a financial crisis, and specific to the telecom sector, the 11th of September events, and the last financial crisis in 2008-2009. If you look at the past 10 years, we have continued to have, after the 2008-2009 crisis, a growth in international investment, with at least in terms of indicators, for KPIs and number, increased number of projects, but a drop in investment trends. There are also explanations uh, simply because of the diversity of the economy, a relative uh, drop of industrial projects in favor of projects more the tertiary. In this framework, emerging countries up until the middle of this uh, decade were the big uh, winners of this period. Of course, the last two years have been very special or exceptional. The pandemic itself was an exceptional uh, event through its magnitude and the impact it's had on all societies. A sudden cessation of the world economy and which is still suffering disturbances in the supply chains. But we feel that there has been this crisis, but we mustn't forget that behind the crisis there were long-term trends which continue. Some have even been amplified. The first is the digitalization of the economy, and the other long-term trend is the ecological and energetic transition that a number of countries have included at the top of their agenda. But we can speak over the past months of a major break with what we call the return of geopolitics in international investment. For some 30 years, we have been accustomed to looking at international investment with economic eyes. In other words, of reasoning with economic terms. It's quite clear that once again, we're going to have to reintroduce in our analysis and strategies the return of geopolitics in international investment. So everything that I presented the key issue is to understand there's been a significant change in international investment. At the beginning of this period, there was a relatively homogeneous approach and fairly straightforward in terms of description. This simplicity is, of course, no longer appropriate for some 15 years. In the past, we had fairly essential investments, basically industrial, site creation carried by a large company, usually North American or possibly European, addressed to Southeast Asia. If you look at all these characteristics of international investment, be it the typology of the actors, the activities, the modalities of investment or destinations, you see extreme heterogeneity in all aspects of international investments. And this is very important because it means that the international investment market is fragmented. This fragmentation is very significant for countries because it means that there is no possible claim to global attractivity. Attractivity can only be seen by segment, and it's up to each territory, each country, to identify the segments on which it wants to be positioned. Markets are subject to numerous changes. These 
factors of change we'll be dealing with with Vincent. Vincent and I are in the Paris office of OCO Global, a company which, as you've understood, is specialized in international investments, working with countries, regions, territories, but as Ismail said in his introduction, also working with uh, companies to help them in the localization choice. Our work is to ensure that territories and uh, companies can meet. Thus, apart from figures or trends, it's important to fully understand what is happening on the investment market. So, in this respect, we have a certain number of factors, which we have already in part referred to, of the fragilization of supply chains, and also new environmental regulations, which are ever more marked in countries like Western Europe or Europe in general, in Canada, maybe a bit less in the US, but very clear there is a trend of new environmental regulations to respect the environment and behind these countries, other countries are also beginning to follow this trend. There are new societal aspirations that are emerging. And as we said uh, very quickly, digitalization of uh, production processes, but also services. Digitalization is affecting the whole of economy. And in some sectors, there's a dearth of labor. I'm thinking about uh, IT, for instance. And that's uh, something that each territory, each country has to take into consideration. The new ways of organizing work with uh, the development of uh, telework, home office, and then there are geopolitical trends with uh, instability, uh, tensions uh, around uh, raw materials, be it energy or farming raw materials or commodities. Now, what impacts for APIs, or IPAs rather? What is the specific place or position for emerging markets and LDCs, how can we enhance this position? I'm speaking about a specific position because once again, as I said a while ago, there is a fragmentation of investment. So it's really hard to think globally. You really have to understand what are the segments on which uh, you're able to position yourself. So there's the specific positioning and then there's the strategic uh, targeting, how can you uh, address uh, segments, activities, sectors uh, that are the most interesting for you. And then sometimes you're going to have to adapt the offer of a given country to uh, these evolutions, be it in terms of uh, training, education, infrastructure. And then when it comes uh, to IPAs, you need to adapt the way you promote investments because obviously if sectors changes, if activities change, the way you used to attract investment projects or projects to be invested in is going to change. Good afternoon, one and all. I'm going to take over from my colleague at this stage. What we wanted to show you here is that, well, we said a lot that uh, growth uh, is uh, slower despite uh, uh, the fact that uh, LDCs uh, are recovering, it's slower than very well-established markets. I worked uh, quite a lot uh, for a certain number of you, and uh, I can't help seeing an opportunity in this. When I see that growth is uh, slower than uh, the rest of the world on average, I see huge opportunities, and uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. And there's one thing that I'd like to recall that seems essential to me. Don't forget that for businesses, for investors, for businesses at least, investment is absolutely critical. If businesses don't invest, they die. They constantly need to find new investment opportunities. And uh, I think uh, uh, emerging economies uh, can come into play at this juncture. If you look at things very simply in terms of uh, uh, market opportunities and prospects, that's exactly where it happens. And then there's a, a pool of labor. That's where things will happen tomorrow. As Laurent said a while ago, 
we see that these two uh, levers for uh, attractivity, they're May, they may be hard to implement, but that's uh, the way that you can improve uh, LDC's uh, appeal. Of course, you have to be smart in your positioning on the markets. Uh, uh, you've got to be astute, but I think these two levers are very important for future appeal of uh, LDC economies in the future. There will be demographic growth. Uh, and therefore, uh, the future uh, client pool, the client pool of the future is located in these LDCs. Yes, and if I may uh, add on to what Vincent has just said, it's something that we didn't uh, explain very much, but there's been a huge diversification in international investments in these past few years, especially towards LDCs. Very often, we tend to associate uh, LDCs to uh, mining activities, extraction. Of course, these activities remain very important for LDCs, but there have been new types of projects, new type of activities, new type of sectors emerging in these LDCs. Uh, think about uh, major investments uh, in uh, fintechs, uh, investment uh, in financial services, technologies. These investments are things uh, that we uh, see a little less uh, in investment flows. They're not necessarily measured by uh, uh, international organizations. These are uh, immaterial services, um, call centers, uh, fintechs. Uh, they've, got, they've got a very low uh, capitalistic uh, intensity and therefore they're hardly visible in international statistics. And yet they're extremely important because uh, very often they create a lot of jobs. Just to give you an example to what's just been said by my colleague, this diversification is necessary in all countries, not only in emerging countries. All countries need to diversify, and this goes through international investments. But another example, another recent example, and this is not something that you see in stats. It's something uh, that uh, I've learned uh, from speaking to uh, my uh, business uh, clients. But very recently, I've heard uh, from a client in the food tech, uh, European um, uh, uh, player who looks very specifically, not necessarily for now, but for future uh, investment opportunities in Africa. And that's something new. Uh, when you speak, when you think food tech, uh, you think obviously food, but there's a lot of tech. It's not necessarily something that they'll be able to do alone. They're in touch with quite a few institutions, quite a few partners who are there to support them to decrease uh, the level of uh, risk when they invest in countries uh, that are of interest. But this example, uh, there are very few examples. Uh, they don't appear in the statistics, but uh, there are future opportunities uh, that are starting appearing. It won't happen from one day to the next, but it's going in the right uh, direction. And let's see uh, the glass half full rather than half empty. Now we, as Laurent said, our brain is divided into two because our activities are divided into two. Half of our customers are countries, territories, so we help them attract businesses. And the other half of our customers are businesses and we help them choose where they want to invest depending uh, on their specs. And uh, I would just like to add that there is never a conflict of interest. We either work for the one or for the other and never for both at the same time. But we always think uh, like a mirror. We always think about the point of view of the investor and we always look at supply. Uh, that is the territory, the country. And uh, here we wanted to uh, uh, present to you a, a summary of uh, the impact on businesses of these uh, deep-seated changes that have occurred ever since the pandemic. Well, they were there before the pandemic, but they've really stepped up ever since the pandemic. And so there are impacts for businesses. And just to uh, identify a few, uh, there's the need to diversify businesses sourcing. Uh, we spoke about uh, uh, difficulties uh, with the global supply chain, not only semiconductors and electronics, uh, where the situation was extremely tense during the pandemic. But businesses uh, realized that the just-in-time model 
It's not that it's not efficient, it's that it's very risky. What happens if uh, tomorrow's economy stops all of a sudden? And there are quite a few customers say, well, we've understood, we've understood that the just-in-time model uh, uh, is uh, way too risky at this stage. So we want to opt for a hybrid model that's a, a combination between the just-in-time and the just-in-case model. So you have enough uh, visibility to meet your customer's need for uh, at least several months. So diversify your sourcing. And then there's the integration of uh, ESG standards. Uh, quite a few investors are, uh, are under quite a bit of pressure. Now, uh, let's face it, these trends, well, businesses uh, don't do it uh, out of their good heart. Uh, they, there's, there are, there's a lot of uh, environmental regulations being enacted in quite a few countries uh, that make them adopt these standards. Uh, look at what happened uh, uh, in the U.S. with uh, electric vehicles. We see businesses who have to change the way they think about manufacturing. Sometimes it happens way too suddenly, in actual fact. But uh, this is just to give you an example uh, that go to show that there are very deep changes occurring. And now that environmental regulations have started this change, there are customer expectations. It's very important for businesses, for their image. Well, there's a real paradigm shift in this respect. And I'd like to add that for the time being, it's very complicated. We can define a positive uh, investment project with positive impact, but it's really hard to measure these, invest these investments and compare them from one territory to the next. That's what we're working on at OCO Global, but it's very hard to implement. Uh, it's not something uh, that's uh, self-evident. We're working on this with quite a few partners, especially with partners who work on international development and who are interested in these questions. But what we would like to measure uh, the, these trends. Yes, and this is something that we see in a lot of uh, European governmental agencies. We've just supported the British governmental agency uh, to define a set of indicators to measure this impact, this the ESG impact in uh, uh, their success in attracting international investments. And then one last thing on ESG, the, sometimes uh, ESG means environmental for a lot of people, but uh, there's a social component and sometimes there's a society component. This is something that is hard to grasp, it's hard to implement, it's hard to monitor, but we have to be able to do so if we want to extend these standards in all countries who receive investments. Other impact on businesses, uh, reintegrating geopolitics, what I've observed is that businesses are apolitical in and of, itself, in and of themselves, mm -hmm. and they should remain apolitical, yet uh, they're facing a major problem. Investing is uh, a, pro a long-term project. It uh, costs a lot of money. You take a lot of risk regardless of the country of destination. And I'm not only talking about the industry, I'm also talking about uh, the service sector. You're looking at sev several years down the road, uh, 10 years down the road, and CAPEX and OPEX, uh, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's very much a long-term thing. And yet, we're in a world where we have no idea what's going to happen three months down the road. Uh, look at COVID. It came as a surprise to everybody, except for just a few. Hence, the sudden shock to everybody. Same thing with the war in Ukraine. No one had seen it coming. So we're 
in a world that's very uncertain, very unstable, the pandemic and geopolitical tensions with Ukraine as well as break Brexit came as a wake-up call to us. Uh, they uh, really shook us, shook us up, not necessarily in our everyday lives, but they reminded us that anything is possible. Anything can happen. Nothing should be taken for granted, and no one can be sure what will happen. So how can you proceed when you're not sure what's going to happen and you know that if you don't invest, you die? Well, you do invest. You have to invest. And that's where what Laurent said occurs. You segment your uh, investment portfolio. You integrate uh, more data to try and forecast the future, to uh, diversify your risk, to hedge against your risk. Uh, there is a risk inherent to an investment decision, which is much higher than what you thought. And therefore, it's your interest to diversify. And there again, I think there are huge opportunities for um, uh, developing economies. So that's from the point of view of countries. How should businesses look at uh, investment opportunities ever since uh, the recent crisis, especially COVID? For territories, the impact, well, they need to redefine their positioning, rethink uh, their strategy that happened even before but they need to update their strategy even more frequently than before they need to validate their strategy even more frequently than before make sure that uh, they're going in the right direction you know that you know this better than us if you change strategies every day uh, you don't get anywhere so you need to believe in your strategy you need to give your strategy enough time to bear its fruit but you need to have the right tools and the right information to cross-correct if necessary and to adjust your strategy. So uh, strategic aims are of the essence. Secondly, you need to reaffirm your strategic choices and follow the direction that you've defined for yourself, that you've set for yourself. It's something that we really believe in. Businesses are the ones uh, who require that uh, uh, there is compliance with uh, ESG standards. Uh, ESG stands for environment, but also for social and society. Finally, meet new needs, satisfy new needs. They're not necessarily new needs, or they're not necessarily only new needs. They're more needs because of uh, the segmentation, fragmentation of uh, the investment, international investment market that Laurent referred to a while ago means that uh, uh, there are a lot more decision-making mechanisms that are a lot more sophisticated than before. Uh, deciding uh, to invest uh, relies on the same fundamentals, but the criteria change quite a lot. And depending on the segments that uh, you aim for, it changes quite a lot. It's not the same customers, not the same cultures. You're, uh, you, you really need in your job to uh, listen to what your customers want and uh, adapt to the way uh, your customers' uh, decision-making criteria change. So I hope this was clear uh, as to the impact on businesses and on territories. And uh, I think uh, we've come to the end of my presentation. I hope we didn't take up too much of your time. Switch to the next session immediately. Thank you so much for the presentation. And thank you so much for the opening statements to Mr. Adra Ratnakar Adhikari and Mr. Usama Kaisi. And um, we are very much looking forward to be working together. And I would like to quickly switch to the next session. And I would like to invite Ankhdad, Ayelo, and Unido to the stage. Thank you very much. Sit down. Thank you very much. Sorry, I won't be
this one? I guess so, yes. Um, Um, <clears throat> welcome. I know it's late. Um, very sorry for that, but uh, we will um, we will do this um, probably in, in in 40 minutes or so. Um, I have some slides to to share. Um, I believe that. Um, okay. Um, also, Stefan from Unido has a few slides to share. Um, but I I will start with, um, of course, welcoming you. Um, so late in the day. Um, we have uh, with us uh, um, Emily Sims from, from ILO. She's the senior specialist there. Um, and um, um, Hank Tran from uh, the um, uh, Enhanced Integrated Framework of WTO. Um, Stefan will join us in a, in a few minutes. Uh, he, is, um, he was in the earlier session from Unido. Um, you were introduced to him. And then, um, who else? And then, of course, Ismail will join us uh, as well. Um, because we have been developing, together with um, the um, Enhanced Integrated Framework, as UN organizations and WIPA, a uh, training platform for um, investment promotion agencies of LDCs, and would like to, to share that with you. Um, the training platform is going to be online. Um, the intention is that about 20 IPAs from LDCs will participate in this uh, first phase of the program. Um, the training will be in English. It's going to be in a period of six months that we will provide the training. And um, the training hours that participants have to put into it will be about 40 hours as we calculate. So I will sh share with you a little bit about um, the modules that we're going to uh, um, uh, which are being going to be part of that training, um, but also a little bit about why we are doing this. Now, in the first slide, um, this is a little bit uh, information on the project itself. It has two components. One is a couple of surveys that we are doing, surveys of IPAs in LDCs, something similar that actually Unido has been doing for that other program, um, as well as um, a survey among investors on on the, on the perceptions that they have um, for investing in LDCs, as well as what they see as emerging opportunities. And I have a few slides on, on, on outcomes of that. These are the modules that we're going to produce. Um, the first module 
is on investment promotion and facilitation in SDG projects. Um, that is going to be done by UNCTAD. Um, it's actually going to be done next, uh, next week. We have uh, um, two days in which we will uh, deliver this program. Um, module two will be um, presented by uh, UNIDO. Uh, Stefan is, going, is in charge of that, which is uh, dealing with uh, project appraisal um, uh, in SDG and, and COVID-19 related projects. Uh, module three is going to be um, presented by ILO. Um, in which uh, a focus will be on decent work and inclusive economic growth. And module four will be presented by WIPA, and they will look at investment promotion networks and partnerships and the value of that. Um, that the, the timing of these uh, will be um, September for module one, November, uh, um, September, October for module two, November for three, and December for four. And then in January, we will ask participants to do an, a larger assignment on an investment promotion strategy in an SDG sector, and they have to do that in groups. And then there will be a an, an diploma given at, at the end of it. Um, the module itself um, for the module one for UNCTAD has uh, um, these particular um, elements. I don't want to go too much in detail in, in, in any of it. Um, so. The, the first day we will deal particularly with investment in SDGs, promotion and facilitation. Um, uh, we also uh, will do an exercise uh, focused on quality education. You can see later on that that is an, uh, an, uh, a priority of IPAs and LDCs. Investment promotion, stakeholders, practices and tools will be um, covered the next day in which several objects like also partnerships uh, we look at uh, gender um, equality and climate change more specifically, and then also digital tools, which is extremely important these days for, for IPAs to look into. I also want to mention at this point that um, some of you are aware of the LDC-5 and the, the Doha um, um, action plan that uh, um, gives a lot of attention to investment promotion. Um, with a focus on uh, promoting investment in education, for instance, in clean energy, in digital infrastructure. And, and these are all subjects that are going to be covered by this training workshop on how IPAs could, could, could channel investment and could attract in investment in these particular tech sectors. A few slides with some graphs just to show you the importance of FDI as international finance for, for developing countries in this particular one. On top, you see foreign direct investment. And this foreign direct investment that goes to developing countries is more than 50% of all foreign direct investment in the world. So developing countries are receiving quite a lot of that. Um, and the other lines that you see is portfolio investment, the orange one, uh, remittances, which is for, for a number of countries very important. Um, and um, on the bottom, you will see ODA, Official Development Assistance, what, and you can see that in the next slide, is very important for LDCs, because their ODA is the top line when it comes to um, investment or to international finance that comes into countries. Here, you can see that FDI inflows is relatively less important for LDCs, but that is also an opportunity if you can see how much FDI goes to other developing countries. So um, total FDI here has been um, going up for the last couple of years, so that, that is good. Um, and that can also be an opportunity to match certain projects with development aid as well as private investment. I also wanted to share you the slide. On Je voulais également vous montrer une diapo sur le genre d'investissement qui sont dans les ODD. En 2014, nous avons calculé que pour atteindre ces ODD, il fallait 2,5 trillions de dollars États-Unis par an dans les pays en développement. Le secteur privé est donc nécessaire. Les premières années étaient très prometteurs. Après 2015, après l'approbation des ODD, un certain nombre d'investissements privés ont été adressés à l'ODD. La crise Covid a mis un arrêt à tout cela. 
et les gains ont été perdus. Voici le chiffre pour 2021. En 2021, une reprise, 70% d'accroissement d'investissement dans les projets ODD, dans les économies en développement. Mais si l'on regarde le nombre de projets, nous n'avons pas encore repris le niveau pré-pandémie. Et que pour les énergies renouvelables et l'éducation, qui représente la part du lion, si vous regardez la valeur des investissements en énergie renouvelable dans les pays en développement, 30 fois plus que la valeur qui est adressée à l'éducation. Il faut en tenir compte. Du point de vue positif, nous avons vu dans le sondage, avec les investisseurs dans ces projets, qu'ils voient des possibilités intéressantes dans l'agri commercial, la sécurité alimentaire et les énergies renouvelables. D'autres secteurs tels que le numérique, l'éducation ou la santé, au lieu des cinq et cité, ces investissements ne sont pas encore perçus comme des possibilités pour les investisseurs. Et puis, un sondage qui a été réalisé pour les API, nous avons vu que leurs problèmes émergents ou leurs défis étaient les soins après coup pendant la crise du Covid parce que les API essayaient de retenir les investissements et n'avaient pas les outils pour le faire parce que les outils numériques n'étaient pas suffisamment développés. Et l'on voit également l'un des défis qui a été rencontré, c'est une technologie numérique insuffisante. Et donc la formation portera sur ce domaine et les outils sur lesquels travaille l'ONU dit. Également les défis portant sur la promotion de nouveaux secteurs, santé, d'attirer des infrastructures numériques, d'éducation. Et ici, nous allons cibler dans la formation et de pouvoir aider les API à pouvoir renforcer leurs capacités dans ces domaines. Et dernière diapo que j'aimerais vous présenter sur les priorités que les PMA, les, les API dans les PMA voient dans leur travail en ce qui concerne les ODD, ODD 8 et 9 sur le travail décent et la croissance économique, industrie, innovation sont très élevées parce que c'est un domaine traditionnel que les, dans lequel les API ont travaillé et voyez que d'autres ODD tels que l'éducation ou la santé ont également un résultat relativement élevé. Plus de la moitié des API voient ceci comme étant un élément prioritaire. Mais, quoi qu'il en soit, ils le voient comme un élément prioritaire, mais en même temps, n'est pas vraiment en ligne avec ce qu'ils ciblent. Si vous regardez l'éducation, plus de la moitié des API dans le sondage ont dit que c'était prioritaire, mais il n'y avait qu'un API qui avait ciblé ce secteur. Donc, la euh, formation essayer d'en tenir compte et comment ceci diverge par rapport au secteur cible qui relève des ODD et d'essayer d'apporter une différence. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je crois que j'en ai fini. Et si vous avez des questions, nous pouvons bien entendu le faire après la session sur cette formation. Et j'aimerais maintenant me tourner vers Émilie ou Stéphane. Bien, alors c'est vous qui allez prendre la relève.
Merci beaucoup, Paul. Une petite contribution au nom de l'ONU dit. Stéphane Gratch, qui a travaillé dans la promotion des investissements et technologies, qui est maintenant division des normes durables. Mais nous continuons nos activités dans la promotion des investissements. En tant qu'ONU dit, nous sommes très heureux de pouvoir être insérés dans ce groupe. pour apporter une contribution, pour partager nos expériences, pour une approche plus holistique. Et dans les quelques instants qui me sont impartis, j'aimerais vous accompagner sur les méthodologies sous-jacentes qui pourraient être une bonne contribution de l'ONUDI au collège exécutif API, contribution qui découle également de différentes discussions que nous avons eues, en tant que groupe interagence, mais également à la suite d'interventions précédentes sur le développement de capacité dans les masterclass depuis 2018, alors que l'ONUDI a été associé à ces activités. Comme il a été dit, nous allons nous occuper du module 2. Module 2, l'intitulé est ODD. Évaluation de projet COVID, associé au COVID-19. Et notre contribution ici est d'essayer d'aider la promotion, promotion de pouvoir développer leur savoir-faire dans le développement de projets d'investissement. Et pas n'importe quel projet d'investissement, mais des projets d'investissement qui sont orientés par les politiques industrielles ou les objectifs nationaux ou des objectifs concrets que les, les ministères ont pu investir sur les secteurs cibles. Paul vient d'évoquer ceci, euh, euh, ODD 8, 9, 13, etc. Nous avons également le sentiment qu'il est important que les API jouent un rôle plus actif dans la promotion de l'investissement au niveau national, notamment en dans les approches qui associent les intérêts des entreprises nationales avec les intérêts d'investisseurs internationaux. Et nous aimerions donc voir, voir beaucoup plus d'opérations mixtes où les partenaires internationaux et nationaux s'unissent et partagent leur savoir-faire et les marchés internationaux du côté des investisseurs étrangers, ainsi que le savoir-faire traditionnel et local du côté autochtone. Et qu'en groupant ceci, ceci peut générer un résultat tout à fait positif. Par cette contribution, nous aimerions aider les API à accompagner les PMA, les petit des moyennes entreprises à pouvoir les, les accompagner et notamment dans les partenariats publics privés de pouvoir apprendre plutôt que de sous-traiter avec des agences de consultants sur savoir comment réaliser une analyse de pré-faisabilité ou une analyse de faisabilité pour devenir un prestateur de services aux grands projets d'infrastructures internationaux que prévoit le gouvernement, des zones économiques spéciales ou euh, couloirs industriels, et le concept également de quantifier le rendement escompté. Un projet peut être rentable pour l'investisseur, mais cela ne signifie pas que le pays euh, retire un avantage direct en termes de création d'emplois. Je n'ai pas, pas le temps de rentrer dans tous les détails, mais nous venons de lancer un programme assez significatif sur les préparations d'investissement de projets qui est subdivisé en quatre cours. 
chacun ayant des modules différents. Le premier cours, avec cinq modules, voit l'introduction sur l'introduction et l'identification de projet, comment identifier une proposition de projet impossible. Beaucoup de ces projets sont reçus par rapport au projet d'investissement qui offre un véritable potentiel pour le pays. Puis, dans l'analyse de marché, stratégie de marché et de les entrepreneurs qui ont un impact, comment est-ce que c'est se différencier d'autres formes d'entrepreneurs. Deuxième cours, l'analyse technique. Avant de regarder les projections financières, il est important que les différentes options technologiques soient bien comprises et évaluées en fonction de leur durabilité et le coût avant de regarder les aspects financiers. Et ceci est pris en considération dans le cours 3, dans les coûts financiers et les états financiers. Nous n'allons pas reprendre dans le détail ici, mais c'est un domaine extrêmement complexe. Et si l'on veut le faire correctement, ceci nécessite un diplôme en finance internationale, mais nous pensons que les bases doivent être faites, que quelque chose que le API ou certains membres du personnel devraient pouvoir contrôler. Ensuite, analyse du risque et planification. Comme thème sous-jacent au sein de l'ONU dit, les aspects du genre, nous avons eu développement des capacités qui a été lancé sur les investissements dans ces approches de genre, ce que cela signifie, comment l'on peut choisir les investisseurs qui pourraient être contactés pour un investissement dans des projets associés au genre. Et en plus de ceci, au cours de cette session, ce qui est important pour nous, ce n'est pas uniquement la théorie sur comment développer un bon projet, mais également de proposer certains des systèmes que l'ONU dit a développés au cours de ces deux ou trois dernières années pour l'établissement d'un flux de travail au niveau un pays pour pouvoir offrir une conduite de possibilité d'investissement. Un tel système a été lancé maintenant qui s'appelle DIP ou système de profilage des investissements où les équipes de API pourraient avoir des possibilités de sources d'investissement, d'ajouter des attributs, des détails aux possibilités d'investissement jusqu'au moment où une version abrégée est lancée publiquement. Voici l'autre aspect de la plateforme, également lancée aujourd'hui, dans un portique ACT, où les API offrent leur propre espace, 79 pays dans la région ACP, pour lesquels nous avons beaucoup de pays en développement, Afrique, Caraïbes, et il est possible d'utiliser cet espace pour montrer quel est le potentiel d'investissement. Avec ces deux approches, l'une plus théorique, l'autre plus pratique, Nous avons la structure du cours que nous voulons fournir. La première session qui sera réalisée par le lundi le 18 octobre de 14h à 16h, heure Europe centrale, pour comprendre le concept théorique de la préparation de projet, ciblant les projets ODD, et de l'analyse de faisabilité et de formulation de rapports, de pourquoi l'on entreprendrait une telle analyse 
et une session interactive de questions-réponses pour obtenir un retour d'information de la part des participants sur le réalisme de cette approche et les défis qui doivent être surmontés. Au niveau entreprise, politique nationale, deuxième session qui se tiendra le jeudi la même semaine, le 20 octobre, de nouveau pour deux heures, avec une approche plus pratique, en expliquant les modèles, les systèmes numériques et le logiciel associé qui peuvent être utilisés pour ce genre de préparation de projets d'investissement. Ici, nous aurons quelques témoignages parce qu'un certain nombre de API, notamment des API de PMA, Sénégal, Zambie, Éthiopie, qui sont tout à fait utiles pour expliquer les aspects du praticien et enfin de consacrer un peu plus de temps à démontrer, à investir dans les ACP de sa structure, regardant l'approche et la finalité, qui est ce qui est d'intérêt aux investisseurs. Donc nous nous réjouissons de cette sécession et l'OIT a déjà eu une manifestation d'intérêt et encore une fois, nous sommes très heureux de faire partie de ce couple. Merci beaucoup et je vous remercie de votre participation. So, I guess, Emily, then... Emily, je pense que vous allez parler de votre place. Short, I had some... Oui, je serai très bref. J'avais quelques remarques, mais je vois que l'heure tourne. Et je voulais vous présenter l'OIT parce que vous connaissez l'ONUDI, la CNUSED, euh, WIPA, mais l'OIT est peut-être une inconnue. C'est une agence spécialisée des Nations Unies qui s'occupe de ODD 8 sur la croissance économique inclusive et le travail décent. Nous avons travaillé avec WIPA, CNUSED et l'ONUDI depuis un certain temps parce que l'OIT comprend l'importance essentielle des investissements étrangers pour promouvoir le travail décent, notamment dans des pays qui sont moins avancés et pour lesquels les investisseurs, les investissements étrangers peuvent amener du savoir-faire, connaissances, accès aux biens ou aux services qui ne sont pas facilement disponibles, et également générant des complexités et des défis. Et donc, nous avons travaillé depuis un certain temps avec les API, nos partenaires ici, parce que nous comprenons le rôle essentiel que vous jouez entre vos gouvernements et les investisseurs. Et quelle est l'importance pour le développement économique, notamment en générant de bons emplois et stimulant le développement économique. Ceci est encore plus le cas dans les PMA. Et c'est pourquoi nous avons été particulièrement intéressés à pouvoir contribuer à ce projet, ciblant les PMA, le nombre de 20, je crois, parce que votre rôle est un rôle essentiel pour la transformation structurelle et la diversification de vos économies. Et les défis que nous comprenons sont parfois très difficiles. Notre tâche sera de contribuer à votre base de connaissances et de savoir sur ce que recherchent les investisseurs et mon travail en particulier en tant que directeur du bureau d'assistance pour les entreprises avec des multinationales qui se préoccupent de leur réputation, de l'identification des sites d'investir de, ou de pouvoir travailler dans des pays qui respectent les droits des travailleurs parce qu'ils sont très préoccupés de ne pas être pris de court avec des problèmes et souhaite contribuer au développement durable. C'est un domaine de contribution que chaque entreprise connaît. Et c'est pourquoi nous avons été tout particulièrement impliqués dans ce projet. Je n'ai pas parlé des modules, mais maintenant je dois 
On a parlé des modules de l'OIT. Notre ciblage sera sur la quantité et la qualité des emplois, mais pas uniquement. Nous ciblons également les liens, notamment avec les PME, qui sont peut-être pertinents ou non dans vos contextes, mais c'est une priorité importante pour nous sur le développement des entreprises ainsi que la qualité des emplois. Mais notre méthodologie sera essentiellement des études de cas. Nous pensons qu'il est préférable d'entendre d'autres API qui font ce travail pour comprendre la logique, la réflexion stratégique et comment l'on peut identifier des possibilités et également des exercices de pouvoir être dans des conversations difficiles, des indicateurs que nous avons qui peuvent vous aider à évaluer l'impact de création de l'emploi et de la qualité des emplois dans des projets potentiels ou existants. Et donc, j'en resterai là et je me réjouis de travailler avec vous. Je pense que c'est à moi de reprendre où Emily s'est arrêtée avant d'entrer dans des aspects spécifiques. Nous, nous offrons du financement, mais nous allons même un peu au-delà. Je voulais simplement reprendre où Emily s'est arrêtée parlant de l'OIT et ce collège sera fourni euh, à la plateforme de l'OIT et donc mon propre témoignage parce que je viens de finir une formation de ITCOIT et c'est vraiment tout à fait conviviable. J'ai vraiment aimé cette formation et malgré un programme très chargé, j'en ai pleinement profité. Et je puis vraiment être totalement conviviable et très bien conçu. Et là, nous allons au-delà, nous finissons offrons des financements pour ces projets, ou la CNUSED, l'OIT, l'AIPA et l'ONU dit, nous allons au-delà en ciblant la post-formation. À l'EIF, nous travaillons avec 51 PMA, et travaillant avec eux, nous avons commencé une unité d'application nationale pour offrir différents types de créneaux de financement, à développement de capacités institutionnelles, de la, développement de capacités et également d'une analyse analytique. Ces trois créneaux avec l'unité d'application nationale fait que nous pensons que nous pouvons contribuer aux API, à tous les participants, à pouvoir avoir un peu de suivi post-formation. Si vous avez besoin de développement de stratégie, nous pouvons voir des différents projets qui sont en cours pour voir si la demande peut être intégrée dans les programmes existants. Et également de fournir un appui sur mesure en fonction des besoins particuliers. Donc, en un mot commençant, le programme EIF dans les pays est souple et suffisamment ouvert pour tenir compte de certaines demandes particulières, de demandes d'assistance de, au développement pour l'assistance aux API, mis à part la formation dans des cours. Et nous espérons pouvoir continuer à travailler avec vous euh, au-delà du collège de l'API et avec l'ITC et, et l'OIT. Et ce sera un projet durable grâce au partenariat que nous avons établi et pouvoir être un, une activité à long terme. Merci beaucoup. Je vous souhaite plein succès dans cette formation et merci pour ce partenariat. J'ai déjà assez parlé aujourd'hui, 
mais vous savez combien je suis intéressé par ces projets. Et nous travaillons avec la CNUSED, l'OIT et l'EIF et l'ONUDI, avec chacun séparément. Et ici, nous aurons l'occasion de travailler tous ensemble pour un projet. Et ce sera peut-être le seul projet multi-agence pour les API des PMA. Selon nous réjouissons, notre module mettre sur la promotion des investissements pour un développement durable et en formalisant nos sessions, comme je, je l'ai dit, nous, nous, comptons, nous comptons toujours sur le retour d'informations de votre part. Nous aurons également des analyse sur vos perceptions de ces modules. Nous serons donc en contact avec vous. Et un avantage que nous avons et que nous avons pu initier ces projets, avant le projet multi-agence, nous essayons également de fournir un retour d'information sur les discussions de coordination qui ont été entreprises par la CNUSED et autres collègues. Et donc, nous essayons de grouper nos efforts pour s'assurer que tous les API et les ministères peuvent travailler ensemble pour atteindre nos objectifs. Et j'espère que ceci sera d'intérêt pour tous les API des PMA. Et nous avons commencé avec non pas 20, mais avec 12 API. Puis... Nous avons ajouté les API francophones. Maintenant que le nouveau projet, nous avons un plus grand nombre de PMA et nous allons plus, couvrir plus ou moins tous les PMA et pour être en contact avec tous, pour être sûr que toutes ces sessions soient faites de façon coordonnée. Et je suis toujours très heureux de travailler avec toutes ces organisations internationales mais pour euh, WIPA, ce sera un honneur de travailler avec eux. Nous nous réjouissons de voir travailler avec eux. Et vous, ce sera un voyage extrêmement intéressant. Et je me réjouis d'avoir votre retour d'information pour pouvoir affiner ces projets en fonction de vos besoins. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Ismaël. Let me just say... Merci, Ismaël. Quelques mots en conclusion. Comme je l'ai dit, nous avons maintenant 17... API des PMA qui se sont inscrits, certains avec un participant, d'autres avec cinq ou six, et des zones économiques spéciales. Il y a encore un peu de place. Nous sommes en contact avec quelques autres API qui pourraient s'y intéresser. C'est un engagement. Ce n'est pas simplement une question de mettre en marche son ordinateur mais que nous aimerions que vous puissiez suivre tous les modules et les devoirs qui y sont associés. C'est plus que simplement formation sur place, c'est un engagement. Et donc les API doivent prendre ceci au sérieux et de se donner le temps de le faire. Nous pensons qu'ils sont mieux à même de pouvoir mieux comprendre toutes les activités à la fin de ce cours. Thank EIF uh, for, uh, for, for their financial support and also support actually in, in bringing, this, uh, um, bringing the news of this new program to the LDCs, as well as UNOHRLLS. This is the uh, High Commission in, uh, for uh, um, least developed countries in, uh, in New York. Um, Susan Wolf, who is our counterpart there, she couldn't make it because she had another meeting. Um, but uh, also they will uh, participate uh, at some point in the training um, and they are also very much involved in, uh, in reaching out to the different um, LDCs. Um, with that, I, uh, I'd like to, uh, to close, uh, close this session and thank you very much for your attention. Is there, unless there are still questions here that you would like to ask? Otherwise, I think The gentleman there. Can you introduce yourself? 
you indicated that it's going to, it's going to be an online training. Yes. Is there a limit to the number of people that would be participating yeah. in the course? Yes, there will be a limit. Um, and you're from? I'm sorry? You're from which? I, I am from Lesotho. Ah, from Lesotho, LNDC. Yes. Okay. LNDC, yes. Um, now, yes, there, because we will, we will monitor the students, there will be assignments um, to students, so yes, it's... Uh, you, your question was if it was... Is there, a limit? No. there is a limit to it because our capacity is also limited in, 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 in monitoring the different students and the assignments. So, but at the moment it's still open uh, and, and actually we have reached out to LNDC if they're interested okay, in this particular one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and that was quite recently, so you may follow up with your colleagues or we c I can, I can uh, give you the contacts on that. There's <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Lesotho took part in our previous project as well. EIF yes, yes. phase one, phase two, therefore, I should thank you for the commitment, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was also one of the reasons why we didn't reach out in the first um, time, because you were already in the previous training. Um, but we have now some space, so that is why we also reached out to LNDC. Yeah. Any other questions? The gentleman there. Oui, bien sûr. Uh, moi, c'est Idriss. Idriss Aya. Hi. I come from Niger. I looked at your slides. In one of your slides, uh, there were 20 countries listed. Country, 20 countries who will participate in the training. Is it possible to extend that to further countries? Here is that this is number the phase number one of the program, and there will be a, a second phase for Francophone countries. Um, so it's, we haven't at this stage really reached out to Francophone um, countries for this, for this particular training, because it, it is not only following the training in English, but there will also be assignments in English, and that may be a challenge for some of the IPAs in Francophone countries. Yeah. No, yeah, we, we, we did, but then we, we, we made sure that they have that capacity to, to follow it. So if you, if you think that you will be able to, or if there's individuals in your agency that can follow it in English, then uh, please reach out uh, to me uh, after the session. And, uh, because you said you're from Niger. Right? Niger, yeah. Niger has participated in our... Um, we have regular... Uh, this is a project specifically for LDCs, but we actually train as a group every year. We have, uh, I guess, what, what have we been calling it? Master class um, for IPAs in general on, on strategies for investment promotion for sustainable development. And Niger, I believe, has participated twice, um, your colleagues. So, yeah, um, so I, I know at least you have a few colleagues that it would be perhaps interesting for them in this round, but obviously in the next round with the francophone. LDCs, you would definitely be on our list. The other thing is that uh, um, the ILO um, um, International Trade Center in Turin, which I didn't mention in the beginning, but was mentioned by our colleagues from um, Tang, Hang, um, that the uh, um, they have a very sophisticated platform um, in which we are doing this training. Um, and uh, um, it will also, th this whole training course will be online afterwards uh, available. So it, if you want to follow it without going through the course itself, that will also be possible. This, this will be in a platform that will be open and all these courses will be available there. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Oh, there's a question on the left. Gentlemen. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ishmael. Uh, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, maybe it may be just be nice to note that uh, some Francophone countries also train their top management staff in English. So some of them can effectively follow up some of those things in English. That's what we have been remarking of late. And uh, on a personal note, I really want to congratulate you people for, for this work. Um, Ishmael and the team, the executive director, Paul, and all of you who have put in so much uh, to get this 
particular type of platform open. If I can recall, as an old um, hand in the wiper business, mm -hmm. there was something of uh, uh, an MBA course at one time, which had, which was developed for, uh, for some, uh, I think, a diploma for for an MBA in uh, in business promotion, which never worked. Uh, I think there was something that was developed at one time a couple of years ago, and no, which I never saw the light of day. So uh, to see this working is really okay. proof of the fact that mm -hmm. you guys are doing a very, very commendable work. And I, I know the team there very well. Yeah. And I, 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 can, I can only encourage I, uh, 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 young uh, uh, IPAs you know, to, to, to get involved and to get on board. Thank you very much for the great work and, uh, mm. and thank you for everything. Oh, thank, you, thank you for these words. And, and it's, it is true, the, we worked on, on that curriculum for a master in investment promotion, and it was there at Edinburgh University for a few years, but it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it is still something that we once in a while have discussion uh, about. We had it with South Africa, for instance. They were interested also in setting up a master program uh, at one of their universities. So um, it, may, it may come back. It may come back. But this is uh, a little bit... Uh, this is what we can do at this point. Yeah. <laughs> um, and nice to see you again, by the way. It has been a long time. <laughs> Any other questions? The lady in the back. Oh, thank you very much. I just want to confirm any cost implications, even if they are non-financial. No, there are no financial. It's an online training, okay. it's, uh, and it's done by UN agencies and WIPA. There are no financial implications. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, then once again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. And uh, you are all invited for tonight's gala dinner uh, at Borivaj. You are welcome to join us. We've been speaking a lot. We are tired. <laughs> so let's have fun a bit. Have a great evening and see you soon. <laughs>